Sure. I'd like to open the uh, 13th meeting for the Globe and Conservation Commission meeting at uh, about 7.35. Okay. All right. Um, all right. This meeting is being held virtually through Zoom. The town of Littleton began conducting remote participation Zoom meetings pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law on March 19th, 2020. Since that time, unanticipated legal concerns relating to the open meeting law have been brought to our attention by the town clerk. Those concerns were supported by the attorney general's office and confirmed by town council. One concern is that the chat function allows a parallel text conversation to a board's public meeting. Chat is essentially running commentary that is occurring but is not moderated or followed by the chair. All participants and listeners may not be aware of comments being made because some meeting participants join by phone and do not see these conversations. Another concern is conversations between residents within the chat room, which are not incorporated into the public record. In response to these concerns, the town will implement the following changes, which in no way prohibit any member of the public from participating in discussion and sharing information during a public meeting and will ensure that all listeners and participants have equal access to this meeting. People that join the Zoom meeting are set so their microphones are muted. If you called in by phone, please use star six to mute or unmute your phone. So it can occur in an orderly fashion. We ask that people who join keep their microphones on mute so background noises do not interfere with the meeting. If you wish to participate in the meeting, please use the raise your hand function available on Zoom. Or if you called in by phone, dial star nine, which will activate the raise your hand function. Um, the meeting host will notify the chairperson of the raised hands and the chairperson will determine whether and when to allow public comment. When called upon, participants should unmute, state their name and address. Then after speaking, we request the participant return their microphones back to mute. There you go. Okay. Anybody got any uh, corrections or omissions to the April 22nd and I guess the 27th meetings? I have um, just grammatical on the April 22nd in the first paragraph with K halfway down commission discover the um, so areas of the site are not stable. It just needs a T. And then on that same line, Mr. Gadru spoke more about the actions that they, they is just grammatically just needs changes. Those are the two that I had. I'm sure Anna has some. <laughs> yeah, I actually had similar edits. Um, I was not at the 22nd meeting, so I just did editorial stuff. I didn't do any substantive changes. And I saw yours came through. I just haven't. Uh... Yeah, I sent it to um, uh, to Amy via Google Doc sharing. Okay. I, move, I move that we accept the minutes for April 22nd as amended. Sarah, I had a quick thing on the 27th meeting. That, um, so we have to do the 20. We got to do 22nd first, one at a time. Sorry. Yep. yep. I'll second that motion. Okay, we have to do a roll call. So if you can just say your name and your A, I, or nay. Um, Jim? Hi. Anna? Hi. Jul uh, Julie? You're up. Hi. Carl? Carl? You're muted. You're muted. No. <laughs> Kyle? Kyle, Kyle Melberg. Yeah. Kyle Melberg, I. Sorry. Sarah, Sarah Seward, aye. Okay, so 22nd is done unanimous. Okay. April 27th, can I have a motion to accept those minutes, please? Uh, if there's no further correction. Kyle had a, a change on one of them. Okay. I just had a, um, on the discussion for the Dirty Farms Enforcement, <clears throat> we had a discussion about, and I think there's pictures too, of <clears throat> water short circuiting going into cell one. Um, didn't see it in the minutes. Unless I, I put a quick yep. I think I sent it over to Amy as well. Okay. It, good, Mr. Goudreau had mentioned he was, they were going to look into redesigning that area as well because they noticed it. Okay. Anybody else have any other? Yeah, I had, um, oh, can you hear me? 
Yep. Yep. Okay, good. Because <laughs> um, I'm looking at the document. I wasn't looking at the Zoom. <laughs> um, okay, I have um, a, a few edits on the public meeting notice of intent for 20 Forest Road um, paragraph. Um, uh, it should say Mr. Samarco recused himself as a family member and as an abutter, right? And an abutter? No, because his family member is an abutter. As a family member is... Andrew's family member Ah, an abutter. Oh, as a family member is an abutter. Oh, okay. I get it. I get it. Um, okay. Then um, original was edited um it says origin origin eight all yep. <laughs> um and then let's see the third sentence um says all site work will be outside of the 50 foot no disturb area although some pairing and i think it's supposed to be paving right yep the paving or parking i couldn't i made the same question in my notes as well but. yeah Parking. Okay. Yes, yeah. parking. I think it was parking, right? Parking. Yeah, I put parking in my note. Ah, okay. And and then uh, about in the middle of the paragraph, it says the catch basin, even though it's uphill, will be protected. There is a proposed infiltration trench to catch post constructing, and I think it should be construction runoff. Correct. Um, and then. That's it for that paragraph. And, and then uh, also the enforcement order, Durkee Farms. Um, I just made some edits because you, you shorten erosion control to EC uh, partway through. But um, so I changed it to the first time you mentioned erosion control, I changed to EC and then made it EC throughout. Um, and three quarters of the way down, it says when Miss Green noted the area, I changed it to visited the area that in the morning. Yeah, I, I did see all your comments. I got those. Okay. All right. Um, and that's it for that. Anybody else? If not, can I have a motion to accept the minutes for the April 27th meeting, please? I make a motion to accept the minutes for April 27th as amended. Do I hear a second? I'll second it. Okay, and I guess all those in favor, we go through the roll call. Okay, so roll call, Jim. Uh, yay. I have to say your name. Jane Pickett, yeah. yay. Anna. Anna Mayer, yay. Julie. Julie Rupp, yay. Carl. Carl Melberg, yay. Kyle. Kyle Maxfield, yay. Sarah, Sarah Seward, yay, unanimous. Okay. I guess we got some, some administrative discussions to take up. 119 to Hadawan Brown Property Purchase and Grant. Amy, you want to speak to that? Um, yes, I think we need to, um, you guys will need to make uh, have a discussion and make a vote about whether or not to contribute any money to that purchase. Um, so I, I just want to mention that now, if you want to put it on the agenda for June 1st, um, I could do that. When do they have to have an, be notified that we're going to support it or what have you? It's, it's going to be a little while we're working with, uh, the CPC and, uh, SVT and chasing a couple grants. Um, so nobody wants to move first, basically, and they <laughs> won't support. Um, so we're just trying to have the discussions. I don't think there's any final commitment now, um, but in particular, we want to make sure the Brown family knows that we're moving ahead. That the yeah. Moving ahead. yeah, this was first offered like a year ago or more since we, when we did that site visit. Amy, was it you, me? Right, yeah. It was um, last, like, last fall. So I think the the family does need some sort of commitment from the town. I felt that back 
when we when base came in that we kind of indicated that we <clears throat> were non we were in support of it but I don't think we gave them a figure that we would be willing to uh, put up. No, and the discussion uh, at that point was that you weren't comfortable giving a number until you knew what the appraisal was. And the appraisal is still yeah. being held a little bit close to the vest right now. So it may need to be an executive session. I was wondering that. I believe Chase is talking to the planning board tonight about releasing the appraisal. Um, mm -hmm. so if you're agreeable I'll, I'll put it on the agenda for the first and figure out whether or not it needs to be an executive session which will be a whole new thing to figure out so if your prediction really is like a disobedience of the bible i'm sorry that was it, it, you were breaking up jim i couldn't understand that I said I was wondering if we can get a vote as far as that would like to follow through us as when we hear get more information for the first meeting. Yeah, I, I don't think you need a vote per se. Just I'll put it on the agenda. Huh? You have okay. The have the discussion. Um, now. Yeah, let's do it. Put it on the agenda. You got it. Can we save some of the discussion things for later on and start with the agenda? Sure. Um, well, do you want to do the, uh, the the town meeting warrant first? Okay. That was the first thing, get that out of the way, because the rest of the stuff can can wait if need be. Okay. Um, what if, go ahead on that, Amy. Uh, do you see my screen? Yep. Yeah. So uh, this is the draft town meeting warrant. And they would like your vote to support or not Article 18, which is for the Conservation Commission open space budget. Um, it, before the pandemic, it was 7,500, and that has not changed because it's not coming out of the general fund. Um, so I see no reason to go up or down on it, um, increase or decrease it. And they just wanted your vote of support if that is the case. So you felt that it was um, it was an amount that meets our needs, or I don't know. I, I mean, can we even change it? <laughs> I guess I'm wondering. Um, it, isn't it a set amount because that's what they pay? That's how they the, the amount they pay for the lease. Um, no, the the seventy five hundred was the amount. Um, I had come up with, and you guys had voted on that ages ago. It it incorporates some additional survey and some assumed maintenance um, on some of the properties. Um, didn't have a new parking lot in it. Um, I, oh, I think some of the kiosks in there. So it's it's the same budget as you had voted before. And I, so, so we do have a choice. Work. We do have a choice of increasing it or decreasing it or doing whatever we want. Or I, I think I think that that has already gone past. I think we should just stick with what we talked about earlier. Yeah. Well, well, it's also the personnel. Yeah. Right. Doesn't it it recategorizes? So that's not okay. Because I thought I saw that in the oh maybe it's the personnel bylaw amendments. Because I thought I saw the categories eight and ten still there. I mean, if it meets our needs, I guess we should just stick with it, I guess. Huh. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this is the year to be um, asking for more money. <laughs> yeah. But I thought I saw, so I guess I could use clarification. It's just the budget part and not the personnel amendment because it- this, this is from the Oak Hill Cell Tower Fund, which can only yeah. be- on conservation lands. Right. No, I know. I'm just, I'm questioning. I see two article 18s here. That's all. Oh, I'm sorry. I get it. I, there's a typo. Oh, okay. So that's article 19 then instead. Now let's see. CPA is 17. Hmm. There's 18, 18. Let's see if they, uh, so the finance committee one is also said 
stated that it's that's just a typo. Yeah, the, the, the finance committee one nineteen. It's it's. I a reviewed that article. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I re I also looked at the budget, so I. It, it seems like, you know, if that's the budget we've had and it's not going up or down, you know, I, I, unless there's a distinct reason. Um, you know, perhaps we can ask for more money in the budget for the Brown property. But that's coming out of the Oak Hill. I know. So it's not going to, that's where the money would be coming from. <laughs> right. It would be a whole separate movement of money. Yeah. Okay. Probably maybe not even fall town meeting, but it's, it's not this one. Okay. Yeah. So, a Amy, you need a motion. A motion and to approve it and a vote. I'll make a motion to approve article 18 uh, as written um, in the fiscal year 2021 conservation commission open space budget. Do we have a second? I'll second it. No, it's Julie. Now I guess we have to go to a yay vote. Yep. So this will be a roll call vote. So Jim. Uh, James Pickett, yay. Anna. Anna Mayor, yay. Julie. Julie Rupp, yay. Carl. Carl Melberg, yay. Kyle. Kyle Maxfield, yay. Sarah Seward, yay. Unanimous. What about the other one that's mislabeled 18 or 19? Do we have to vote on that one too? No, no. It's just that one. I'll, I'll let them know that there's a typo in there. Okay. So is the people from the point coming in on the conservation restriction or? They are here. I'm trying to find them. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. It's Ray Lyons. Hi, Ray. Hi there. I see this uh, Stefan Q. Trubes from who's a construction manager and Steve Ivis from Ivis Environmental are also online. And Tim uh, Power. Is Tim Power there as well? Yes, yep, just joined. Good. Thank you. So the team is here and um, I'm here. I've been working on the conservation restriction for this property. And um, is there any questions before I dig into what I wanted to go over with you? Dig right okay. in. So um, this property is actually two different properties. And, but what's before you is one conservation restriction. And it's my intention to have, there'll be need for two conservation restrictions, one for each ownership but that they will be identical except for the names of the owners and the property descriptions that they apply to. So there's just one before you will hone that one and then I will duplicate it. Uh, for the people who are listening on, this total acreage of about 20 acres, it's just north of the, uh, the, the point project, the market basket. And um, it's designed primarily to protect Blanding's turtles and least bitterns. Um, for your background, I've been working with Misty Ann Morrow on this, and I'm using Natural Heritage's um, template baseline conservation restriction for this, making as few changes as possible from that template. And Misty Ann is, is satisfied with where it is today. Uh, one thing that we talked about but decided we wanted to defer to the commission was the question about uh, public access. And because um, public access always sounds nice, but it's not always a great thing. So um, when I'm working with private landowners, and this is another one where there's a private landowner, uh, you need someone who can control what happens to the property if the public unfortunately abuses the privilege of entering the property. So some conservation restrictions allow, they basically mandate uh, public access. And then it's very hard um, to control it if there's problems. It can also be that the landowner has the right to control public access or possibly that the, that the holder of the conservation restriction, which in this case would be the commission, would have that uh, responsibility. So that's one of the things I wanted to go over with you today, get your thoughts on it and uh, any other comments that you have. And then the next step will be to send it off to the Division of Conservation Services for the EEA review process. And once it all seems to come together where Natural Heritage Commission and EEA are all pleased with where the uh, conservation restrictions are, then I'll create the second version 
we'll get the plans behind it and it'll be circulated for approvals. So um, this property is mostly wetlands. It's got Beaver Brook flowing through it. Uh, there is a trail. Okay, Amy's got the, the conservation restriction up there. Or not. No, I see it. No, it's, I'm only getting page one. It does this to me every now and then. Continue talking. Okay. And try again. So there is a trail that flows along the top of the, uh, the retention ponds um, that lie along the parking lots. There's, that's a good plan to have up there. So the conservation restriction will not apply to those retention basins because they're going to have to be um, maintained and that means they'll be dug out and they won't be very natural um, periodically. So rather than having that be subject to both regulatory review and under the conservation restriction, that area that Amy is, is showing in red, that is not part of the conservation restriction, but all the area that is just above that, that's in gray, uh, will be subject to the conservation restriction. Now there are some trails that pass through that. Uh, one comes through from westward uh, and starts roughly where her red dot is now and passes through. And then the other one comes off of the town fair tire property in a ways and, and does a short loop onto this property. So I don't think the point has any intention of closing the property, this part of the property to the public, but there are questions about what happens if there are problems. And for example, problems could be people trashing the place, people bringing in unleashed dogs that are disturbing the turtles and the, the least bitterns and other wildlife. Um, you know, who will be responsible in a sense for monitoring and, and, um, and protecting the property uh, from people in the public who abuse the privilege? I had one school of thought, same as the Light and Water Department or Water Department holds a restriction on Beaver Brook. I didn't know whether the, this would be a good place for what the Water Department keep tabs on it. Well, the it's required that the commission have a stake in this uh, because it's going through your regulatory authority. And natural heritage also has a, a secondary role uh, in enforcing this. Um, I believe I checked in that this area is not in a zone, it's certainly not in a zone one, and I don't think it's in a zone two. So I'm not sure what gets added by having yet another entity um, with responsibility for enforcing. If it's within five, was it 500 feet of the their present well on Beaver Brook it would be, and I think that property would be within 500 feet. I will double check that. Yeah, I, I would imagine it's in a, it's at least in a zone two. Mm -hmm. I, I, this is Carl. I would um, I would probably suggest keeping with the concom just because of the the, the the habitat values associated with that area. What are people's thoughts on public access or not access? Well, what about if we're silent on it? I mean, isn't that something that, you know, we don't want to maybe encourage it, but we don't want to prohibit it. So if we, if we don't, um, who would you know, be monitoring it? So uh, this is Ray uh, and a good question. If, if we don't say anything about it, it defaults to the landowner being in control of, of access. Now, you always, as the holder of the restriction, have the right to step in and take action against the landowner if things are being done that violate the conservation restriction. Um, and who, I'm sorry, I probably should know this, but who's going to end up being the landowner ultimately? So there are two landowners and one is the point LC one LLC and the other one is DSM MB two LLC. 
So they're li limited liability corporations, both of them? Correct. That's a common real estate holding entity. And so at some point, if they decide to dissolve or sell their entity to somebody else, you're going to end up dealing with another owner? Right. That's true of any <laughs> conservation restriction. The landowner can always sell the property and you have to deal with the new landowner. But, but Jim, it goes in perpetuity, so it always it's not going to go away. Okay. Exactly. It, it's tied to the land. It's not tied to the owner. Right. I see. So if, if the document is silent on it and something happens, um, then it will be up to the landowner? It would be first up to the landowner, yes. So they're going to have to have a representative in charge or appointed? There will always be someone for the landowner. <laughs> so as the property is either sold or transferred to somebody, some other entity, we it should be written in there that they give a name and address of who the contact person would be put to the Conservation Commission. That's Jim, I think, I think that's in there, but I will double check and make sure. Okay. I, I believe there's a clause that in any, it's in the boilerplate section that says that, um, um, there, that at any time, if the, let's see, well, not assignability, it would be further down, that's but there's, there's a clause that says, it should be mentioned in any deed for the property. Ray, is there any historical piece to have them send in a annual report? That so it's, actually, it's, it's sort of just the opposite, uh, Sarah. Usually it's the holder of the restriction that goes and visits the property every year to monitor it and make sure that it's in conformance uh, with the terms of the restriction. Okay. And then, and then there's a, then there's a, a a report that's given out of that comes out of that. So the lender is that would be us if we're the whole. Yeah, thing. it's Correct. like any any of the other conservation restrictions that I monitor. The ten or dozen or so in town that the conservation commission holds. I mean, I mean, is it getting to the point where uh, you need one of us to help you monitor these? Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. I mean, that, if get more staff. Just... Sorry, Anna. I just no, that's okay. You know, Anna, Amy was supposed to get another staff member, which now isn't happening. So, right. it's like a blanket, you know, and adding, you know, adding things to Amy's plate is, yeah, you know, a, I mean, maybe we need uh, an adopt and a <laughs> and adopt a CR. <laughs> Each one of us maybe have an option to adopt one for yeah. monitoring. So one of the things that will happen in the short term is this thing called a baseline documentation report, which is a, a detailed report, usually with lots of pictures, uh, that documents the condition of the property at the time that the conservation restriction becomes effective, which is when it goes on record. Um, that'll be something that'll be put together um, as we bring this part of this project uh, together uh, later this year. So they'll, exactly that letter F that's in the middle of your screen now talks about the baseline documentation report. So that's actually the big document that serves as a reference for the rest of time. So and Ray, we'll take care of that. Something? We'll do that. Okay, Ray, can I ask you a question um, regarding the baseline condition of the property? Mm -hmm. um, my... You know, so this this project started prior to my tenure on the commission. But you know, as a resident of town, my recollection of these wetlands that are you know in the area um, in question for the conservation restriction is that um, there has been a you know a pretty significant increase in the Phragmites at the site. You know that that wasn't there, and I was just. You know, and I know we're talking about the conservation restriction, but from mm -hmm. a, um, you know, baseline documentation of the site, you know, prior to construction, you know, versus the invasive species, and then, you know, further questions, which I'm guessing 
you know, we would need a biologist to answer about the Blanding's turtle and impacts. I'm just curious, um, you know, the, is it appropriate to have the baseline documentation based on now versus when the project began, you know, when there was less coverage of, you know, Phragmites, for example? Understood. I think the right answer is to, is to do the baseline documentation report as of the date that the conservation restriction goes on record. That doesn't mean that we can't have a side report that perhaps ba is based upon um, ortho photos that are taken every year or every few years of right. the site so we can document how the Phragmites have been migrating through the property. And, and then you, know, you have both your conservation restriction holder powers here and you have your regulatory powers under the Wetlands Protection Act here. And if something needs to be done, it's probably more appropriate under your regulatory powers. Um, but that's something you can give some thought to. I don't think that affects what is actually in the conservation restriction Understood. that I will send off to, to, to Boston for review. Okay, thank you. And the point did do, I think it was three years of Phragmites control in, in areas that were actually outside of the CR area, but, but they have done what was required of them under the uh, order conditions. Okay. Yeah, for the public who's listening, there's, there's two hats that the Conservation Commission is wearing here. There's their regulatory powers under the Wetlands Protection Act, which would be the orders and condition. And then there's also this conservation restriction. whose primary purpose is to make sure that the land is not altered in a way that affects, negatively affects the planting turtles or least bitten and their supporting yeah. habitat. I would actually yeah. also say someone, um, I think Jim and maybe Julie brought up the water department. They actually may want to reserve the right to put in a test well or something with approval from both sides, something like that. We may want to, I can run that by um, Corey Godfrey, the water department and see if they feel the need to let that possibility in somewhere. Okay. I got a, another point too, is that there's the, a lot of the drainage comes down from the common that would come through there and where we had one spill two or three years ago, we'd have to be able to allow whoever to go in and clean it up. They do have gates at the uh, bridge crossing there. Mm -hmm. That stopped a lot of it. But that's that was my concerns as far as Wadi Department having a being part of the uh, CR because that is a tributary to right at, right at the head of the, the uh, wellhead. Hey, Amy, this is Carl. Are you, uh, the trash that blows in there, I did see the, uh, on the um, agreement here, I did see the prohibited use of the rubbish, but is, is Market Basket currently, or whoever uh, cleaning up any, uh, blowing bags in there or who will do that in the future? That would be the owner. Correct. Is it, is it being done right now? I, I don't know. know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. Um, so Stefan, would you know? Stefan, can you answer that? Or Jim or Tim? Part of our, part of our maintenance for the landscape uh, of the site is also uh, weekly trash picking of both the parking lots and the surrounding areas. Thank you. Is that, well, that, that will continue, that will continue uh, when this uh, CR is in place? It'll continue as long as we uh, oversee the site. Right, in terms of a, a spill cleanup, I mean, that's, that's gonna be true on any property anywhere that would people somehow have the right to go in and clean up, do a spill cleanup. There's, there is nothing in the conservation restriction that would, that would uh, prohibit remedying a, an emergency situation or a hazardous waste spill, some, any, any kind of danger to the public or to the environment. Correct. Is, is, there, um, is there wording though about trash in this? Um, there's probably up in the prohibition yeah. section. 
It was in, it was it was under prohibited uses. Correct. Amy had it up there for a minute. It's up higher, Amy. It's usually in the first two or three. Keep going. Okay, it should be number three. But there, I mean, there isn't any uh, thing about maintenance in that regard. Um, no, it's just that you, they can't allow these kinds of things to remain on the property. They're not allowed on the property in the first place. So there's no uh, paragraph about maintenance. No, the way it would work is if 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 the landowner is not, if if the landowner is violating this then you would send him an, uh, under the conservation restriction, you could send him a notice of violation, give him time, give him 14 days to fix it, what have you. And, um, and they should bring it into compliance. Uh, you ultimately could bring him to court if you needed to, to um, get the job done, get the work done. In a situation like this, you also have natural heritage on your side. Correct. Okay. Is there anything written in there if we did have to take them to court that we could go after court fees it's, on the town's behalf? It's down in the boilerplate. Legal remedies. Yeah. So, so this is talking about, um, the first paragraph is talking about injunctions. You have the ability to go in and get a court order ordering that work be done. If you could go down to the next page, Amy. So this one does not call for, for attorney's fees to be paid. But this is all um, basically boilerplate on conservation restrictions. Correct. That's, That's right. Of town council. Oh, could you scroll back up to the previous page? On the light, on the, uh... yeah, okay. So this one says... the right to enforce um, who's restoring the premises to its condition prior to the time of the injury. So that's, that's giving us the ability to clean up trash or have loan or clean up trash um, right there. That's correct. In, in, a, in a normal contract enforcement uh, situation, the court will usually award what's called money damages to make things equal or back the way they're supposed to be. This is actually granting what's called considered extraordinary relief, injunctive relief, where the court can actually order someone to do something specific. And that would be, for example, to pick up the trash or to, to clean out something that is not properly in there. Okay. So also actually the, um, the next paragraph answers the question about costs. The grantor, that's my client, the landowner, covered his, whoops, up, back up, Amy. Oh, back I'm up. sorry, that next paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, I'm at the very on, bottom I'm of the screen, it says uh, that the grantor agrees to reimburse the grantee, that's the Conservation Commission, all reasonable costs and expenses, including attorney's fees, incurred in enforcing the conservation restriction. So that's that's where you can come back after. What does reasonable mean in that sentence? Um, ultimately, it's whatever a jury would decide or a judge would decide. I don't think um, we've ever, Amy, gone to court uh, for one of our CRs, have we, like this? No, but for example, this this is what you would use if you wanted to go after the 51 Hartwell people, if they weren't slowly cooperating. This, for, by the way, is very standard language, which the state will not have us change. Right. Can I circle you back to public access or... Um, you want to just go with the default is that we won't say anything and we'll leave it to the landowner. And um, if, if the commission thinks that there's a, a problem worthy of it, it will um, take action against the landowner and the landowner in turn will take it against the, uh, the violators. Well, right now it's written that um, either one of us on either grant or grantee has the right to maintain the existing trails, which would be what's on the far side. Mm -hmm. And then I lost my page numbers, page seven. Page seven mm -hmm. is what you want. 
versus this part about uh, no public. Correct. Or the grantor can, if it becomes a problem. Would would there be any occasion that you would want to like if there was um, some kind of special bird or something that was interesting on that site um, or habitat value? Would there be any reason that you would take like a special group out or want that option to be able to get permission to take a special group, maybe like for you know one day kind of thing? Uh, that's always the the landowner can always oh. allow people onto the property. And it, it's one of the allowed uses, nature study, mm -hmm. in, things like that. The question, maybe in a simplest sense, would be if there's a question about whether the public should be restricted from coming on the property, is the first stop with the landowner or with you? Do you, do you want to have to have a, a session before that's decided or leave it up to the landowner to decide what might be required to protect the land? I, I kind of, I don't like the idea that the grantor, I'm sorry, the grantee um, could just prohibit or control public access without consulting us. I, I would like some wording that they would have to run it by us first. We are the grantee. I thought we were the grantor. Oh, oh, nope. sorry, I have it reversed. Okay. Sorry so for the legal grantee. limbo. But it gives it gives the, both the grantor and the grantee the right to prohibit or control public access. Um, correct. The grantor always has that right. The question is whether to, whether the commission wants that power as well. James, why don't you ask the other commission members what their thoughts are? Anybody else have any comments? Uh, I, I would like to keep some of the um, some of that with the conservation commission if it's not a big deal. I mean, what difference does it make really if the grant if, if we both have it? Okay. I'd like to hear from other commission members, but you know we I can agree with Carl. Uh, Kyle Maxson here. I, I completely agree with Carl. I'd like to have some sort of say in that. Okay. Yep. I I agree as well with uh, Carl. I think we should have some sort of control. Okay. Which is how it is written, correct? I don't I don't understand how we can yes. both how can we both have the control? I'll give you an example. I um I wrote one for a property in Tingsboro and the commission is the holder and the landowner wanted to shut down the access. And um at one level, he had that right, but then the commission had the right to say, no, you need to leave it open to the public. And so it's open to the public. Um, and I'll word it the same way. I'll word it. Yeah, I would, I would like us to have the ultimate decision making. I think I'm hearing consensus from the commission in that, in that direction. Yeah. So I, I would say with this property in particular, it's accepting within marked trails approved, which would be the ones on the far side up behind the self-storage. Those are already open. Mm -hmm. Public. Use. So the way this is written, it looks like we have the right to control the trails, but the, the grantor has the entire premises. Is that right? That's how this one is written, yes. I think you very much don't want the public all over this property because um, you've got two listed species here and, and they need, um, you know, they both need places to hide and not be harassed by dogs and people and so on and so forth. So keeping them on the trails, the, the animals tend to figure out where those trails are and how to stay away from them. Um, it seems like, um, um, It, it doesn't expressly say in these two paragraphs that the public has access to the to the paths. Correct. And I would suggest you do not want to have that language in there. 
because then you'll have people holding it up saying, you can't tell me I can't go here. I think I've heard the consensus of the commission. Right. We discussed that before that we don't want people walking all over there. So, so there are paths and we have control over whether the public can go on the paths. Um, so we're just going to let them go on the paths, but we're not going to encourage them to go on the paths by saying they can, I guess. <laughs> and you'll hold the power to say that they can't. Okay. And you might want to do that during migratory period. Blanding's turtles, for example, travel a large, a long distance. And this, I believe this is part of the time of year when they're doing that. And you might want to say, you know, during the months of April and May and in October, uh, we need to close off access for the benefit of the Blanding's turtles. And maybe the same is true for the least bittens. Mr. Chairman, I think I've heard what the commission is want. I, I'll work something up. I think this needs a little tweaking, what I submitted. I'll tweak it and um, in light with what I heard today. Okay. Do we need to, is, do we need to bring this to a vote at all that we agree with what he's saying? Well, it isn't final yet. So, I mean, the doc, he's still going to tweak the document. I was going to say, maybe just a consensus as far as you folks are concerned, would you kind of agree with what he's, Ray is saying? I think Ray's so on the right path. He just has to bring it back. Ray, we meet again on June 1st and June 15th. When would you like to be on the agenda? Um, so next, I want to send it off to DCS, get John Goya's comments, make sure that we're online with him. Um, and then we can circle back with you. Probably June 15th makes more sense. And we need to work uh, town council in there sometime. Sure. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. I'll be in touch. Yep. Bye. So I think you guys are done with the point? Yes. Yeah. Can we go to the... Uh, Continued public hearing, notice of intent, Mass Bay Transit Authority, parking lot, uh, R113-3-5, Mass DP, file number 204-897, improvements and expansion to the existing MBTA parking lot facilities. Hi, Holly Pongren here from the MBTA. Um, uh, we had met, oh, I don't even know how long it's Ben, but at one of your last meetings, um, the commission had some comments and questions. Um, we submitted some additional information very recently to address those comments. And Danielle, are you going to be going through those? Or Andrew? I um, one of them. I think I was going to let you do that. <laughs> but we're both here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I can go through uh, the resubmittal. Um, at the last, the last time we attended, there were a few requests from the commission. Uh, mostly concerning the, the snow removal. Uh, within the O&M, we addressed uh, the timing of the removal, which we have said now that when the snow gets to six feet high, that will be a trigger for snow removal. That was one of the questions from the commission uh, the last time. And then there was also the request for the reduced salt mix that we've discussed it with the MBTA and they're willing to do that. Um, so that's also been written into the O&M plan. And then uh, in terms of what will be installed at the facility, in uh, with regards to the salt removal, uh, some signage was requested. So we've included on the plan to add some signs at the entrance, noting that there will be reduced salt area. And then there's also signage uh, at the locations where snow will be piled to note not to push the snow beyond the parking lot, the paved area. Uh, and then there was also fencing requested and we've added fencing along the top of the wall and blocking the, uh, the access with, with a gate to maintain the, uh, the infiltration basin itself. So fencing has been added to two locations, signage has been, uh, has been added at the locations requested by the commission. And just to add, um, with regard to the fencing, we did confirm with our structural engineer that that does not require the wall. I think, um, you know, we had to have a little bit of time just to make sure our structural engineer didn't need to push anything out. 
um, with regard to that. And we wanted to make sure the impacts were all the same. So everything's the same. We didn't need to move anything. We're able to put that fence right into the wall. Correct. It's going between the guardrail that was there. The guardrail is actually pushed a little bit closer to the parking lot to make room for the fencing. Yeah. What is okay. the timeline now for this work to be started? Uh, Holly, do you have any? I don't have a I don't have a timeline at the moment for the start of the work. Um, I know the you know parking lot folks wanted us to keep moving so we could get it permitted, but I don't have a schedule for construction. Do the commissioners have any concern with the time of year to have the site open? I imagine now as soon as possible to get this <laughs> would be ideal, wouldn't it? I can't imagine that parking lot's as full as it had been in the past. Right. It would happen. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it seems like with, with any site, you know, doing it when runoff can be minimized. Um, you know, but with the COVID situation, you know, it would be more like now, basically, summer, fall. Yeah, now through summer and fall, like you said, you limit the, the season. The realities, yeah, the economic realities, it, you know, put that out of out of folks' control. Um, I imagine this could go a year or two before anything happens, too, so. Yeah. Okay, is there, are there any other concerns or are we looking for a vote on this? What are we looking for, Amy? Uh, looking for a vote and a waiver. Yes, it's within 50 feet. Yes. There's some work within 50 feet. Yeah. Within 50 feet of, um, that's the local bylaw, right? Which yeah. Dan oh, McKay has right. objected. Right. Yeah, right. 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 Our, our bylaw. Never mind. Just for technic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we have to go for a vote. Um, on this right now? Yeah, mo motion first. Uh, close and issue and order conditions. I'd like to make a motion to close this MBTA, um, what do I call it? <laughs> Does it have a, a parking lot? number? Um, parking lot for a Littleton uh, train station. Um, close the hearing and issue an order of conditions. Do we hear a second? I'll second it. That was Julie. Okay. And I guess we have to have a roll call vote, Sarah. Uh, yep. Yeah, roll call, Jim. Yay. Anna. Anna, Mary, yay. Julie. Julie Rep, yay. Carl. Carl Melberg, yay. Kyle. Kyle Maxfield, yay. Sarah Seward, yay. Unanimous. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Good luck. Great. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Good luck. Bye. I guess we need to move on to the notice of intent, Ruben Hoa Library, U19-21-0, Mass DEP file number 204-909, construction of a new library with relative utilities, driveway, parking, and emergency fire lane. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we were with you two weeks ago. Uh, since then, sorry, I'm trying to look for my documents. Uh, since then, uh, we have had a site walk, uh, and I don't know if you want to quickly go over the, the changes that were made associated with that walk. Um, two additional trees, uh, were identified to be removed. They're two 36 inch white pines, um, right in the area of the the uh, curve in the, the new road. Uh, there was also a review of the stormwater outfall uh, that discharges to the uh, resource area. Uh, it was determined that a small spawn, um, uh, plunge pool and some modified rock fill should be placed to diffuse some of the energy associated with the stormwater coming out of that, that pipe. And then finally, uh, there was a review of a section of bituminous uh, concrete that is the current um, 
access roadway uh, that runs between the schools and Shattuck Street uh, that show signs of failure. So uh, a portion of that will be uh, removed in, and replaced uh, to the same limits that they are right now. Um, So what we would do with the with the plunge pool uh, is basically install some modified rock fill. Um, I think that's generally four to six inch um, stone banks and uh, basically in line with the uh, the pipe where it daylights, and then install a, a six inch deep uh, kind of micro pool. Um, uh, in that stone prior to allowing the, the runoff to discharge into the resource area. Um, and then uh, I think Mark uh, is going to uh, discuss uh, the updates on the landscape plans. Hi everyone, Mark Mesrelli, landscape architect here. I'm gonna share some content with you. I'm assuming everybody can see the plan. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so this is the plan that we <clears throat> walked through a couple of weeks ago that has been updated to include the notes and recommendations from Evan Abramson from Landscape Interactions. And some fine tuning has since occurred. Uh, in bottom line is that the pollinator at risk, bees and butterflies and moths are being in, uh, with the plants that are now being specified are being helped with the uh, addition of these plants. So whereas we had a, for instance, we had a, I'm gonna spotlight, we had some, uh, in this area, we had some red twig dogwood that is now, um, refined to be a red osier dogwood instead, something that's uh, <clears throat> more beneficial to the, to, the, um, to the bees and butterflies. Uh, and that, and that uh, thinking has been applied throughout and Evan and I had an opportunity to discuss the um, plants and seeds one by one. And we're, we're both in accord that this plan that you see before you tonight is the um, is the final, and it's also one that promotes the well-being of the pollinator species at risk in eastern Massachusetts. Uh, I, for the interest of time, I'd like to just, uh, unless there's any questions, uh, close my presentation with that and say that if there are any uh, open for questions, because there are some refinements here, I don't know how many of the, this is new, Amy's, this is a plan that was submitted on Friday, the notes are received on Thursday afternoon, and we turn the plan back around 21 and a half hours later um, to the town in the interest of trying to get the information in front of you tonight. Um, hey Mark, could you just run through the, just the changes, not, not everything, but just sure. Changes. All right, I'm going to stop the share for the moment and go back to it just because I'm having some minor technical uh, issues here. Can I can I ask a question while you're switching? Um, on the page, but please feel free to, to yeah. ask. So the red osier dogwood likes wetlands. So I'm I'm not sure. I guess I'm a little concerned about that choice for that location, the top of the hill. Yep. Uh, well, we we believe that the um, plants will have sufficient water in the in the planting areas that are specified. But usually, like a wetland plant, would expect that water is within 12 inches of the surface at most points in the year. I'm just curious. Right. If it, well, it, it's again, <laughs> I'm taking the lead from Evan. Um, yep. We have different plants right. specified, um, and so we've been very accommodating. Uh, I think we've we've incorporated somewhere in the neighborhood of 90, 95 
percent of the recommendations here. Okay. So if we look at the top of the list, the sugar maples are the same, Amelanchia. So the changes would be the corn, the red osier, the Hemimelis is a straight species, non, uh, no cultivar. The um, the eastern red cedars, the Juniperus uh, virginiana, substituted for the uh, Betula nigra. Calmia latifolia was substituted for viburnum. Beach plums were substituted for the uh, Ilex opaca. Mm. The Labrador teas were substituted for the hydrangeas on the patio. The Virginia rose was substituted for the Clethra alnifolia mm. and the willows, the three in a row there, those are substituted for three of the Betula nigra. Mm. And the Spirea alba was substituted for the Nine bark and the low bush blueberry substituted for the Lakotha way. Okay. So that sounds good. That's, yeah, it's a really, this is, an, this is going to be a model landscape for Eastern Massachusetts. Yeah. Now good. the seeds, just quickly on the seeds, he's, uh, we've, we've changed the specs and have a, 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 a technicolor array of wildflowers for the slope and it should be quite a display. Oh, one other refinement to add, the, um, we, there was some layout changes in the, the future pollinators zone that's on the slope. Some of the cedars were repositioned so that we could carve out a, a more generous area in an area that made sense in terms of workability down the road. Amy, are we looking for a vote here as well? I'm sure they are. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yes, and uh, let's see, this also, this one does need a waiver for the um, the fire road, the access road. And probably the repair of the uh, yes. uh, pathway. So I, I would assume, besides the fact that this is a public library, it also meets the public interest for the removal of the Japanese knotweed and the significant pollinator native plantings that are proposed. This is what we would call a win-win. All right, well, I'd like to make a motion then to um, close the hearing and issue an order of conditions and also uh, accept or what do we say Sub uh, accept the waiver or with the waiver yeah issue the waiver yeah issue the waiver um, for I the library do i hear a second second all those in favor so roll call okay yeah. uh jim yay anna Anna Mayer, yay. Julie. Julie Rupp, yay. Carl. Carl Melberg, yay. Kyle. Kyle Maxfield, yay. Sarah Seward, yay, unanimous. You're oh. killing me. This is going to be <laughs> heck of a week for issuing permits. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone that worked right. on this. It was a great, great project. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good, good night. night. Thank you. Uh, guess we move on to a public hearing notice of intent 24 Forest Road, U17 166 0, Mass DEP file number 204 910, demolition of an existing dwelling and construction of a new dwelling. 
septic system driveway and utilities and associated site grading within 100 feet of a bordering vegetation, vegetated wetland. Somebody want to speak to this? So I, I think the holdup was um, we wanted to go see the site. So I took a, you know, took a drive out there, took a look at the site and, um, you know, really nothing that we didn't discuss before. You know, I guess the only thing I would um, reiterate is, you know, which is the reason I wanted to go out there was to see the road. The road is in rough shape, you know, having heavy equipment on the road, um, you know, may or will make it worse. Um, and of course that road, you know, has a, has the wetland adjacent to it. So um, I would just, you know, want to stress that, you know, whereas observations are made during construction that the, you know, the road is, is being impacted that, you know, gravel is used and, you know, other measures, um, you know, to try to mitigate that. So we don't impact the wetlands. Any other comments? I would assume at this point that maybe we ought to bring it to a close and a vote on it. There was there was just one other thing, Scott. Did did you have any consideration of how plowing, snow plowing, might be able to be handled in the future? Well, I spoke to to Bill Sturtz about it. Um, you know the. We really can't make any alterations or improvements to 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 the to the right of way of the road. Um, um, so I don't know what we can really do about the, the alignment location of the road, uh, you know, and 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 how things are are, are plowed by uh, other people who maintain the road. You know, we're we have frontage on the way, we have access to the way, but you know, rights to alter and improve on within the way I'm, I'm concerned about what those how how those rights are limited for for the applicants so uh, i i you know we've added the, the the erosion control on the opposite side of the road as protection and define the limit of work you know to follow the existing travel way um i i don't know really what else we can do out there um without proposing alterations within the way. So if, are you, are you talking about the snow removal or are you talking about like, for example, if a truck, you know, damages the road or, you know, significantly, um, you know, deepens ruts or something like that, like you can't. Well, I was just talking about impeding the ability to, to, to move snow, to maintain the road, to, to resurface it, mm -hmm. grade it stay, you know, compact, uh, whatever, you know, as it gets rolled up, you know, we start planting boulders out there and there's damage to equipment and we're required to do it as part of the project. And, you know, they say, well, you put those boulders there and now you've damaged our, I, I don't know. I mean, it, I think we're, we're limited in what we could reasonably pr propose to, to alter other people's rights in that road. So I, I, I think that the erosion controls temporarily during construction are adequate. Uh, um, and I just, I don't really see what else we could do without potentially creating a problem for maintenance of the roadway. Can you share a plan with that updated erosion control? You said you were going to extend, extend it a bit. Yeah, this is uh, this is the plan from the last hearing. I, you know, I was waiting to hear back from commissioners in case there were other items that came up. So this this is um, not revised as as yet. But it's this erosion control line here that's along our frontage um, from the hundred foot buffer down to the driveway, down to the, the utility pole driveway area here. It's on our side of the road. We're gonna beef beef that up to to um, a hay bale silt fence uh, barrier um, as opposed to just a straw wattle there. You know, create a more pronounced and, and sturdy barrier between you know the limit of the site work. And beyond that, <clears throat> beyond that barrier, really it's just there's no work proposed. Um, 
or just sort of uh, uh, be utilizing the existing gravel drive for access to the front of the site to you know temporarily park vehicles, turn vehicles around, uh, typical the uses that it currently already has. So there's be no widening or improving to the the gravel road that's there. I mean the gravel road is it's essentially a driveway. I mean it's not much not not much more improved than a than a house. I thought road. you were gonna have the silt fence, you know, that's um uh that's at the near the bottom of the road. I thought you were going to extend it up to the like the border. Yeah, again, I haven't revised the plan because we were waiting for commissioners to go out and look at the site, and I didn't want to revise it and then have other things come up and revise it again. So I see. Yeah, Bill, Bill uh, agreed that we could put sill fence across the road during construction, with the understanding that you know we can't prohibit access to people further down Forest Road and want to get to their but, land. But there's nobody further down. No, no, there are, but there are landowners. So. Um, Probably not going to be an issue to put a silt fence across that. <laughs> Unless someone walks their dog down there and, and, and doesn't like it in the way. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't expect uh, any vehicles really to go past that point anyway. So so who owns the road? Is it a private road owned by? Private road, yeah. It was never right. accepted as a public way. Um, so is there an association for the private road such that, you know, if there are concerns as far as erosion, it would be an association? I don't believe so. This is the only two. Improved, there's only two improved houses on on this portion of the road. So okay. I think it's so just, Amy. Just, so right. if if there was some sort of you know like the road washes out, would a letter just be sent to all of the property owners on the road who access the road? I mean, how would that be handled? Yeah, I would send a, a letter to the uh, people with a driveway on that road. I guess it would be, you know, the the, the affected, if you know, it would be the affected frontage. You'd, you'd yeah, it's kind of it's kind of weird situation. Yeah, it, yeah. I, I recognize it's a weird situation. Um, I would think the person that's doing all this heavy construction would be responsible to at least have the road fit to travel over when right. they're done or not make it worse yeah well, it, that's really what my comment speaks yeah, to. Certainly, don't make it worse <laughs> it certainly will be i mean it'll, it'll be improved to to a compacted gravel standard without you know wheel ruts um the water department's requiring a new water main down the road so the whole road will be rebuilt when it's done with new top surface not asphalt but you know graded base Okay. Is the town doing that? Like no. The, no. Yeah. no. Uh, water department's working with us on it, but no, it's private contractor. Okay. okay so if you haven't finalized the plan, I guess uh, you're not expecting a vote tonight then. Uh, we are expecting a vote. I, I, I'm happy to condition those, those minor changes to the plan as to, to a vote. We usually expect a final plan before we vote. Well, at the last hearing, we were expecting uh, commissioners to go out, visit the site and offer feedback, which we haven't received until tonight. So, uh, you know, I think that changing those erosion controls, those are minor changes that we could issue as a condition. It would have to be inspected before we start work, so. Mm -hmm. Well, we could just condition a revised plan be submitted prior to, you know, start of construction. I, I, we, we, agreed to, we agreed to do it. Um, and, and one of the, the standard conditions is that I'd be called to inspect the uh, erosion controls before construction starts. Okay. Scott, is North up on this? Where, where is North? <laughs> where is North? To the right. Okay. So the road silt fence would be extended across the road to the west? Uh, uh, so it would be the south, um, along the south property line across Forest Road. Up so the west, from, yeah. right. from, from where I say end, end silt fence here, yep. uh, across the road. Can you, yep. is there a way to live edit? <laughs> I, I mean, so site visits don't necessarily you know, necessitate in 
um, you know, drawing updates. Well, if the commission could give me a minor recess of, you know, 10 minutes. I'm, I'm just concerned about- I, I could submit a revised plan to you very short, yeah. short order. I just, I need five or 10 minutes, so. Okay. I, I just would like to see, you know, we've in the past when there's been something relatively minor like this, um, you know, we've had like, a, you know, allowed a pen, you know, to do a small edit. And, um, you know, I think that would be appropriate here. My concern is creating more work for, for Amy, you know, or inadvertently ended up ending up with plans that don't match. And, you know, those are things that, you know, have certainly caused headaches in the past. Um, so that that's really my, yeah, my concern. Well, can, okay. can we recess this for five or 10 minutes? I could, I could have a revised plan for you shortly and then just revisit it when I've got it. I mean, it really won't take me very long to touch that up. We're agreeing on straw bales with silt fence in, in, in this area, yes. And then we just want to extend this silt fence across Forest Road. Hey, Jim, do you want to do one of the administrative items while he fixes his plan? Yes, I guess so. Yeah. We'll go back to update on I IME injection molding starting construction, Amy. Oops, sorry. Eight, uh, yeah, so that's uh, very fine. Basically, they're uh, either have or about to start construction. I checked the erosion controls, so they're underway. So you're going to put that for the tracks? Yes. Okay. Update on workers' credit union? Um, they are actually hoping to, I don't know if uh, Brian's out there somewhere, but they're hoping to come in for the occupancy permit, I will say shortly. They are maybe 90% done um, with the well operation and all the plantings. They're working on the um, invasive species control up against 495. Um, I think I think it was later this week, um, clearing out all those invasive species and doing some replanting. Um, so it's it's looking pretty good out there. Good. That was a big scope for them. Um, they do you to uh, is a thorough review of that still needed? Do you need someone to like to help going out and looking? Dave Carroll is out there every day when they're doing the work. Mm -hmm. He's got the full list of the hundreds of plant plugs that were put in and, and helping them all decide. Okay. They all go. So it's it's being very well monitored. I've been out there a couple of times myself. So okay. Yeah, that's what I just mean, like for an occupancy certificate, just verifying oh, what they said they were going to plant versus what's planted. That, that absolutely, that's absolutely. Happening. So that still needs to happen, it sounds like. They're, mo they're motivated. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, MBTA auto trans train control exempt project. Uh, that's just to let you know, this was something they came in a couple of years ago with some of the automatic controls. It's changed the initials for, to whatever it is. Um, but it's still an exempt project. So that's just to let you know, if you see something going on out of the T that's, that's what it is. Okay. Thanks. What can I have shared? Access free paving. Uh, Anna, Julie, and I walked that Friday afternoon. I think it was, um, and agree. It's it's pretty much just a, a repaving of the existing access road and some of the driveways out there, um, which has a a minor project, uh, no need to file um, thing under DEP. We discussed with them. This was uh, Ted Doucette's project because he lives there. Um, discuss with them where the erosion controls need to go. So Ted is going to turn around a letter back to me describing what is going to be done, where the erosion controls would be, and then I can approve that. Okay. At first he was saying that he was going to straighten out a couple of uh, bends, but I guess he switched to not changing the footprint. If he changes the exact footprint, he would need to file a permit. So he... Right. right. No, it sounded like the contractor, like the paving contractor was the one who suggested it, suggested like evening out, you know, cutting off some of the curves and 
straightening some stuff out. It sounded like it wasn't, it wasn't his idea. It was the paving contractor's idea. Um, yeah. It, one of the other things that um, if we could relay back to him, we talked about a hundred feet of erosion control from uh, Wickham Ave down there, down where the start, where the start of the road is, where that hill is. Right. I want to make sure that there's an inflection point at the base of the hill that I think will take most of the flow of the water. And so we just want to make sure that that area has erosion controls. Um, and I would almost think the very top, you know, that's, that's just going to flow down the road. It's not going to flow to the side. So if he still needs a feet, I would be willing to just allow him to shift it a little bit, but I think that inflection point, and I don't know, Anna, if you do, you, if you know what I'm talking about, but basically as it goes in, down and then flattens out. Right. Yeah. Where the grade changes. Yeah. The flat. Um, I'm, I just am a little concerned that that hundred feet or so that we talked about may not extend to that inflection point. Um, but I would be willing to, you know, forego like at the top of the hill, you know, I don't think, you know, runoff is going to head down the road versus to the side towards the wetlands versus farther down the hill. It's certainly sloped towards the wetlands. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I know what you mean. So closer to where that first intersection is. Yeah. And, and I think that area definitely needs erosion control. And I'm a little concerned that that's beyond the hundred feet. Well, I, I can be yeah. out there and stake it out and flag it out. Okay. I just know, you know, it's, you know, a bunch of homeowners, you know, ch chipping in for the project. So they don't have a lot of, I know they didn't have a lot of extra money. Right. I mean, I think in this case, it's probably just going to uh, require waddles, not, not major controls because, right. because of the fact that they're keeping it in the road and it's going to be deep and keeping the water in the road rather than flowing off. Right. No, it should. It's just that part at the bottom of the hill. That's, that's my concern. Right. Right. I'm being sure yeah. any runoff from that area is, is, or is filtered. And if there's a bad storm, I could get enough movement of the water. I can jump the curb. So yeah, yeah that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. There's no curb though. One, once they've, they've cut in that curb. Oh, oh, that curb. Yeah. 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 The sunken road. The sunken road. <laughs> yeah. Does that need to be, uh, do you need a vote on that or are we just. No, we just slot it in, right? Yeah, that, that was for information, I think. It's exempt as a minor project if he stays within the footprint. Right, that too, yeah. Okay. Meeting schedule. Anybody got any comments on that? I yep. actually haven't had the chance only comment, to The only comment I had was that June 15th might be town meeting, um, which means that June 15th meeting would get bumped. Do you have any idea how, do, are they, do you think they're planning on having it in, by Zoom or how, what are they doing for town meeting? They can't. It's against the law to do it by Zoom is my understanding. Yeah. Against the law? Yeah, to do we'll town meeting. Yeah. Well, it's such a large undertaking project. Yeah, the voting, voting would be really difficult. Yeah. Well, yeah, then and it's it's already, you can't yep. prove residency, you don't show, show an ID. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We don't show ID anyway. You well, just that's, that's true. you are to the voting people and they check yeah. you off. But yeah, I think it's, yeah, as far as I understand it, it's not legal for us to do it. Um, I, I didn't research that myself. That's here. That's uh, <laughs> secondhand yeah. information. So, well, I mean, with, with May 18th being like just the, beginning of the release of the stay at home order i just can't imagine us meeting you know over yep. what is usually over 300 people all together and packed in i just can't I'm sure they'll figure it out for us can we go back to forest road <laughs> ready you ready scott so you got it done you're on mute scott Hello, are you there for Forest Road? 
Amy, you can unmute him if he's on mute. Well, actually, it's funny. I can't. Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, this is the uh, 511 uh, plan. Um, we just finished. Uh, added a revision date, extended the sill fence across Forest Road here, and designated the um, uh, main erosion control barrier stake straw uh, bale with silt fence from here to uh, the terminus by the driveway here, and changed uh, added a revision date. Okay. Everybody happy? Somebody want to make a motion? Will that, that detail have to change, Scott? Oops. The detail for that, did that have, does that still show a straw waddle? I mean, I'm not totally concerned. Yeah, I didn't change the detail, but I can. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I completely understand. I'm just making a note. Kind of I'm working on, on, a short, on a short order here. Uh, uh, I'd like to make a motion to to yeah. close the hearing and issue an order of conditions for 22 forest. 20 road. forest. What? 20, 20 forest. Oh, I thought it was 22. Oh. 20. Wait, here a second. I'll second. Okay, hey, roll call um, for the motion, Jim. James Pickett, yay. Anna. Anna Mayer, yay. Julie. Julie Rupp, yay. Carl. Carl Melberg, yay. Kyle. Kyle Maxfield, yay. Sarah Seward, yay. Unanimous vote. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to Six Cottage Way. Projected modification amended to order of conditions under the Littleton Wetlands Protection Bylaw. U26-8-0 SDP file number 204-855 revised and updated plan review. Okay, I think um, everyone has seen on the town website that there's attached articles, there's some line items, there's um, statements and comments. So there's about 35 approximately, which um, are there for everyone to view and acknowledge. I read through those. Um, is the applicant on? Yes. Okay. Is there anything that you would like to be recognized that somebody said something on? Somebody has background noise? Yep. All right, we'll try and talk over it. So, um, if you want to go ahead and try and present your, I believe this is the amendment. I will. Talk, see if we can hear from that. If not, we'll mute everybody. There yeah, you go. Can, everybody, can there. everybody else mute themselves, please? Yep, perfect. Go ahead. Great. So, uh, so thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, Ms. Green. Uh, my name is Adam Costa. Uh, I've been before you once before. I represent Kristen Kazokas, who's the applicant. Uh, what's before you tonight is a relatively simple uh, minor project change. Um, the applicant was last before you in 2017. Uh, you issued an order of conditions in 2017 for a project that consisted of a modification and expansion of an existing cottage, improvements to a driveway providing access to the cottage, and the installation of a, a well and a septic system that was to replace uh, an existing outhouse. Uh, following the issuance of the order of conditions back in uh, the summer of 2017, the immediately adjacent neighbors, the McDonald's, filed appeals, uh, both with the Department of Environmental Protection seeking a superseding order, and also because your order also issues under the local bylaw, filed an appeal with the Superior Court. So, not much has happened uh, in the Superior Court case. That case is still pending. 
Uh, but the reason we're back before you is because there has been quite a bit over the past three or so years that has occurred in the uh, proceedings that began uh, with, with you, uh, then, then ultimately resulted in the issuance of a superseding order of conditions from the that was further appealed to the Office of uh, Appeals and Dispute Resolution, OADR. We litigated at the OADR for approximately two years, had a full-fledged uh, hearing at the OADR with witness testimony. And following that, we received a 45-page decision from the presiding officer that has resulted in the issuance of a final order of conditions. And through that process, there have been a few minor modifications that have been made to the plans. And so we're back before you simply seeking approval from the commission of the same plans, a couple of minor project changes so that there's consistency between what now has been approved at the state level by OADR and what was previously approved by, by the commission. So in addition to having the applicant on Zoom tonight, I also have uh, uh, David Cowell, who is with Hancock Associates. Um, I'm gonna ask David to unmute himself and sort of hand the floor over to him just to very briefly share his computer screen, hopefully share the plan with you and show you what these couple of minor modifications are. Um, when he's done, I would like the opportunity to address a couple of points very briefly. Again, I don't wanna belabor any of this. I think it's a, a relatively simple series of a couple of changes, but um, I do see, and it's already been alluded to, that there is a fair amount of correspondence that's been received by the commission, uh, correspondence from, from neighbors, uh, from the McDonald's themselves. And I, I'd like a brief opportunity just to attempt to address uh, some of that and, and, and um, our, our position on, on that correspondence. But for now, I'm going to yield the floor to David to share with you the plans and describe the couple of changes that have been made to those plans. All right. Adam, thank you very much. Uh, for the record, my name is David Cowell. I'm a senior wetland scientist with Hancock Associates here on behalf of the applicant, uh, Kristen Kazakis. Is, is my audio on very loud? Is that Amy was giving me? Oh, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to <laughs> micro uh, adjust my, my microphone. So I'll talk we're, soft. We're all just backing up. Oh, I'll talk soft. It's better um, than when you first started talking. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Amy, um, if you have a copy of the, or, or can you turn over the controls to me to- um, You should drive? have them on the bottom, the share screen. You should be able to pick that right up. Okay, got it. Yep. Adam walked me through this process previously. So shared screen. Double click on that. You should see your screen. Let's do this. Can you guys see the site plan? Is this broadcasting? Yes. Okay, all right. So this is the site plan. So again, this was permitted as a buffer zone only project. Um, it's uh, the scope of work entailed um, a, a modest proposed addition on an existing cottage that's, that's uh, waterfront property out there. Um, there's proposed septic and there is proposed maintenance to an existing access road um, to the property. Um, as Adam had pointed out, this has been through uh, through DEP review, and if it if it weren't for the um, Littleton bylaw, um, I think that's really what we're here to reconcile. That that the order of uh, order of conditions for all intents and purposes is is on up the chain. But at this point, um, we need reconciliation of the permitting under the wetland bylaw only. So I'm zooming in here. This is the, this here where my icon is. This is the existing uh, cottage. Um, this is Fort Pond right here. This is the shoreline of Fort Pond. One of the things that came through the proceedings was that the um, resource area inland bank or, or um, wetlands along the edge of the pond had not been field delineated. And that on the previous plan, we had just detailed the approximate 50 foot and 100 foot um, buffer zones off of that um, approximation. Since then, uh, we've field delineated the wetland resource area. This was a uh, subject to peer review on site uh, to witness the wetland delineation, um, included Megan Selby of the, the Central Regional um, Office for DEP and uh, Mickey Marcus, the uh, appellant's um, uh, wetland consultant was on site to review and affirm these wetland flags. As such on this plan, we um, the black line detailed here, this shows our, erosion, our proposed erosion control line, but underlain beneath that is the actual, this is the, the surveyed um, limit of the 50 foot no disturb zone under local bylaw. 
Under the previous plan, we had a footprint for proposed addition here, which had actually encroached into the 50 foot no disturb zone. Under the revised approved plan right now, we've uh, redacted uh, any proposed alteration inside of the 50 foot. So we've, we've redacted that. And now the footprint that we're detailing for proposed addition is inside of the, um, or outside of the 50, 50 foot no disturb zone or no, yep. Now, again, it's important to point out that the square footage for proposed addition, when, when Kristen was before the commission originally, she had a proposal to do an addition, but didn't have architectural plans or designs yet as to how it would be configured um, on the, um, the um, cabin or the, the cottage. And what she did at that time was had permitted the maximum possible addition that, that, that she would want to work within those limits. And the actual as built of this when it goes to design will be smaller than the footprint as permitted. So that's just important to point out. Based on the field wetland delineation, we also broadcasted the 100 foot buffer zone as field delineated, which is detailed as my icon is drawing along the, the outside of the yellow hatched area. So that's the 100 foot buffer zone. And then at the 100 foot buffer zone or outside of that, there's, um, there's a wellhead and there's proposed septic. There's a leach field proposed up here. Now there's also another wetland on the property. There's an intermittent stream inside of a bordering vegetated wetland system in which there's another flag series here on the property. And this broadcasts the 50 foot no build zone and 50 feet is also important for Title V setback distance. And then there's the 100 foot buffer zone broadcast from that direction. So again, the septic system is proposed um, um, within uh, 100 feet, but outside of 50 feet. And then there's the, um, the driveway, which goes away from it. We actually have a, a second detail here, which, uh, yeah, it's here. Forgive, it's such light line type, I, I really wanna zoom in. So this is, um, I'm trying to get my bearings here. So this is, this is Shagbar Drive. She has an existing um, driveway access to her property right here. It's, it's detailed as an existing cart path. And what she's proposing to do on the cart path is um, it's just a little bit degraded. Um, all she's looking to do here is uh, surface uh, surface grading, which is really like just one foot uh, leveling of pit and mound uh, contours. There's some depressions in there and then um, dressing it with uh, stone dust. Um, we did propose there is a stone retaining wall here, which is just outside of the, the 50 foot note. Um, oh no. It's uh, alongside of the edge of the road. And this is, um, it's less than four feet. So this doesn't require a structural engineer. It's, um, it's more just to stabilize the shoulder of the road. And in a nutshell, that's it. I'd like to turn it back to Adam and the commission. Um, and if there's any other questions pertaining to the delineation, um, I'm happy to jump back in and, and discuss it. Hey, David, David, if I could, um, yeah, can, you, please. can you show the as-built plan to show the locations of the pump chamber for the septic system as well as the well. The third oh, yes. There. Sorry, here we go. Thank you for reminding me, Adam. So she had she had initiated some work out there. And again, keep in mind that here's the 100 foot buffer zone in one direction. Here's the 100 foot buffer zone in the opposite direction. And that this entire area between the 100 foot buffer zones is um, outside of wetland resource areas and, and jurisdiction by the town and mass DEP. Um, but this is the, this was an as built done by uh, Joe Pesnola that was uh, provided to the uh, Board of Health. And um, the septic chambers are located here in this location. And this was, I'm sorry, Adam, remind me why this was microsited based on, um, uh, um, it's, it's shifted slightly, but I think it's well within uh, the, the reason of what would normally occur um, from um, a permitted plan to what's what's as built. And again, it's compliant with all environmental regulations uh, under the Wetlands Protection Act and local bylaw. That's correct. Thank, thank you, David. So David, if you could leave the, the screen up for a moment, I think it might be helpful. 
Um, sure, I'd so, be happy. Thank you. So, um, so back to, to you, members of the commission. So I, I appreciate um, the description of the project and I had asked David to provide uh, a, a bit of an overview because it has been three years almost since the project was last before you. But what I think is important to remember, and, and I'm not gonna harp on it too much. I see that your council's present tonight. And if you have questions about process or procedure, I presume that you'll defer to her, but we're not before you to re-litigate or discuss or seek any sort of approval for the driveway or for the cottage footprint. Uh, or to discuss delineations of the wetlands um, with the exception of the wetland uh, delineation that was uh, further refined along the edge of pond. All of that has been, number one, already through your commission and is the subject of pending litigation in the Superior Court under the local bylaw. And number two, has been now vetted by both DEP staff, by DEP itself, by OADR. Uh, and so we have a decision in that regard. We're simply before you, and this is why we've we've called it, we've termed it a, a minor project change, we're simply before you seeking to do two things so that the plan you approved is consistent with the plan that OADR approved. And that's number one, eliminate that portion. And David, if you would go back to the, the scope of work plan, page one, show the cottage footprint. Number one, remove that portion right where the cursor is of the proposed addition that was previously in the location that would now be the 50 foot buffer and then number two, going back to the interim as-built plan that David just had on the screen a moment ago, actually show you the location of the existing well, as well as the, the, the septic tank and the pump chamber. There had been discussion when we were before you, when Kristen was before you back in 2017, about where the septic tank and pump chamber would actually go. There was a proposed or, or a, a best location shown for the well, but it had not yet been determined. So those have now been determined. And so we're submitting this plan to you much as we did with the OADR to get your blessing for the location of these features. These features are now further outside of the wetlands and, and outside of, uh, of the 100 foot buffer um, than they were before. So we're before you seeking uh, your endorsement of, of these, these project changes. I noticed getting back to some of the correspondence, you've got what, you know, uh, 20, 30 pages of correspondence linked on your website received in connection with this application. And, concerns raised by neighbors and abutters and, and residents, uh, some in support and a number that are in opposition. And I have a real concern as I reviewed specifically the letters in opposition that those individuals, why I appreciate their, their respect for wetlands interests and their love of the pond, and many of them have resided there for generations. I, I fear that maybe they haven't gotten the complete story. In fact, I know they haven't because I've been involved through these various proceedings that I've referenced. I've been involved through the approvals from DEP and OADR. I've been involved with the, the Board of Health's issuance of two different septic uh, system permits for this project. So I know the full story. I know the experts that have given uh, testimony at the OADR, and I know what the OADR decision says. Some of these letters that the commission has received aren't addressing what we're before you for. They're not addressing a reduction in the footprint of the cottage. They're not addressing a relocation of the well and the, the septic uh, tank and pump chamber further away from wetlands. They're talking about concerns with what's being built within the, the 50 foot buffer, which and suggesting that it's substantial, which as you can see, it is not. They're expressing concerns with a wetlands delineation that was done three years ago and has already been approved by the commission. So I guess in concluding, all I say to the commission is, you know, please remember what it is that we're before you for. We're not asking you to reapprove a project you've already approved. That has been approved and is pending appeal with the Superior Court. We're simply asking you to approve these two minor project changes, both of which are more beneficial to wetlands interest than what was originally approved by the commission. Thank um, you. Sorry, could, could I ask um, if it's still um, in court, is there a potential for there to be further changes? So we'll approve it tonight, but then we'll have to approve it again. So, um, if, if I could, Matt, uh, Mr. Chairman, through you. So um, I'll, I'll answer that. And then to the extent that your, your counsel wants to uh, offer anything, certainly she can. So my, my position is we have a pending proceeding in Superior Court that challenges this commission's issuance of an order of conditions under the local bylaw. We have delayed coming back to the commission for the better part of three years now, knowing that we had proceedings pending before the DEP awaiting a superseding order 
knowing that we had proceedings pending before the OADR, awaiting a final order of conditions. But now that we've been through that process, while it's always possible until the final appeal has been exhausted that something changes, we're quite confident that under the state act, we have an approved plan. It's now been through three levels of review. It's been reviewed by our three different experts, including two wetland scientists. We're confident that that plan is complete. And with respect to the matter that's pending before the Superior Court, the appeal of your order of conditions under the local bylaw, we'd like to, rather than litigate that case and litigate a case that involves a plan you approved in 2017 that is now inconsistent with what we're building, we'd like to get the blessing of this commission so that we can at least be litigating the correct plan and not have to spend another three years in litigation commencing three years from now. That's our justification. That's the rationale for us coming to the commission now not three years from now, and frankly, not two and a half years ago. Thank you, Adam, for that clarity. So can I, can I ask a question about our, our order of conditions, you know, would, would expire, you know, I think later, later this year, um, Amy or Rebecca, do you, you know, is that something we need to, is that something that's before us that we need to consider? I believe Rebecca can can weigh in on this that, that the uh, the expiration date is is stayed while this is going through the motions. Is that right, Rebecca, or is it? Um, that's certainly true for the um, permit issued under the State Act. I think um, there's a little bit of a gray area about the permit issued under the bylaw, but um, I would defer to the applicant's counsel as to whether, you know, no extension request is before you right now. And the applicant's counsel can determine whether, you know, one is necessary and come back before you. And, and I can tell you uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, that the, the position of the applicant, and I appreciate that um, we have the benefit in the context of the Wetlands Protection Act of um, as you well know, having dozens of pages of regulations that provide for, you know, every intricate detail concerning the, the process and procedure and the substance of uh, what are what are reviewed by conservation commissions and then what follows in the event of an appeal through the superseding order, through OADR and then beyond into the courts. We don't have that same uh, benefit of state regulation when it comes to an appeal under a local bylaw. But our position is that the, the order of conditions, much as is the case under the state act, doesn't be final until it becomes final. And by virtue of it having been appealed, it did not become final following its issuance in 2017. And although it's been pending in court, unfortunately, the courts don't move as quickly as we would all like. We, um, we were awaiting uh, a court date for um, many months, so almost a full year in that litigation. We finally had one for mid-April, and then thanks to COVID-19, that was canceled. Any of the other commissioners have any questions? When you say it's in court uh, for the local bylaw, forgive my uh, ignorance on this matter, um, do you mean the regulation or the bylaw? So I, I, I mean, um, again, through you, Mr. Chairman, so I, I mean, um, both the regulation and the bylaw. So as, as the commission is probably aware, uh, when you issue an order of conditions, even though you issue a single document on a state form entitled order of conditions, you are essentially issuing that document under both the State Wetlands Protection Act and because your town, some towns haven't, but because your town has adopted a local bylaw and regulations, you're also issuing that same document under the local bylaw and regulations. The, the, the Commonwealth has provided for a bifurcated appeal process. The State Wetlands Protection Act provides a process that runs through a superseding order, an OADR appeal, before it ever gets to the courts, and then it can run the gamut in the courts as well. Under the local bylaw, it's a what we call a certiorari appeal under uh, Chapter 249, Section 4, which is an appeal that's taken and goes directly to court under the local bylaw. So we essentially have to fight the fight on two fronts, uh, once defending the order that you've issued under the local bylaw, and then once defending it um, uh, under the State Wetlands Protection Act. 
So it, it, to the extent that we're in superior court, it's both under your local bylaw and the regulations that you've adopted pursuant to that bylaw. Okay, thank you for that clarification. I also, because I was confused in that when you were talking about the, um, um, the uh, working under the state um, reg and in the courts, they were, it looks like they referred to our 50 foot. So when you, when you appeal it to the state, they also look at our bylaw, don't they? They, they, they uh, again, for you, Mr. Chairman, so, um, so they don't look at your bylaw. If you, if you would, David, go back to the, the scope of work plan, the first tab that you've got open. So we, of course, um, and, and by we, I really mean Kristen, because I wasn't involved back in 2017, Kristen prepared a single plan for submittal to the Conservation Commission, a single scope of work plan that showed the 100-foot buffer, it showed the 50-foot buffer, uh, because the application, as I just described, was being made both under the State Wetlands Protection Act and under your local bylaw. Right. Appealed, as was the case with the McDonald's appeal in this case. And it appealed both the court under the local bylaw and to DEP and then to OADR under the state act. It's an appeal of the order of conditions it issued, and it's appeal, an appeal of a single plan. So there's really no way to go back in and erase the 50-foot when we're in front of OADR and say to them, well, ignore the 50 foot because that's something that is imposed under the local bylaw. They don't really speak to it. And if you read the full OADR decision, if you're interested in reviewing all 45 pages of it, I did supply it to the, to the commission. That's you'll right. that they speak extensively about the extent of jurisdiction under the Wetlands Protection Act, the 100 foot buffer. They talk about erosion control, but they don't make specific references to a 50 foot no disturb zone because that's something that's imposed by the local bylaw. Okay, if there, no one else has any other questions or comments, do we have any motions here? Well, I'd like to make a motion. <laughs> Sorry, oh, making all motions, but. I have a question. I just got off a of mute. Can you folks hear me? I, I'm sorry, who is this? This is Ken McDonald. All right, yeah, I was gonna say, Mr. Chairman, did you wanna consider any public comment? I was looking for raised hands. Can't hear the chairman. Go ahead, Mr. McDonald, please state your residency. Thank you. Uh, this is Ken McDonald. Uh, my wife, Jody, and I reside at 42 Shagbark Drive. We are butters to Six Cottage Way. We have lived here for over 10 years. Um, for more than nine years, I've served as a board member of the Fort Pond Association, currently elected as president of the association by its members. In 2017, I attended the commission's public hearing for this very project and expressed my sincere concern with the wetlands delineation of the project. I stated that the resources needed to be properly, properly delineated in order to be properly protected. I requested at the time a peer review of the wetlands to be done to resolve this uncertainty. Uh, and the transcript of the hearing shows that the commission was favorable to this request, but the applicant uh, refused to provide property access. Um, so I hired Michael Marcus, also known as Mickey Marcus, who is widely known as one of the top wetland scientists in the state. He uh, served as the president of the New England chapter of Society of Wetland Scientists, and also for multiple, multiple terms uh, on the boards of directors for Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions. Um, Marcus's survey identified uh, three significant discrepancies with the wetlands delineation on the project. Uh, the first, through soil sampling and vegetation identification, he determined the wetlands line along the stream where the septic system would be installed uh, to be off by as much as eight to 12 feet. Uh, second is the identification of a certifiable vernal pool confirmed through testing just 65 feet from the proposed expansion of the cart path uh, and absent from the plan. A third is a wetland seep near Fort Pond, also not shown in the plan. And there's third item um, of the three findings that Marcus uh, brought to light is really is what's required uh, the applicant to request tonight's amendment. Uh, but the updated plan submitted by the applicant is still incomplete and inaccurate. 
as it's missing the vernal pool. It also uh, does not correct the wetlands uh, line discrepancy that Mark has identified. Uh, both of these are significant and impactful to this project proposal. Um, I should also point out that the sequence of work filed for this project states that the construction of the cart path into a second driveway, because uh, the product, the, the property already has a driveway from Cottage Way into Six Cottage Way, um, this construction of this cart path will include uh, tree clearing, earth moving, rock and ledge removal, and now that we know is all within 65 feet uh, and um, upgradient of a certified vernal pool. Um, the proposed project of this construction in the cart path, uh, as was mentioned earlier, does include a four foot, uh, actually a retaining wall that's less than four feet, but what was failed to mention is retaining wall is 70 feet long and would be completely inside the 50 foot no disturb area. Um, section 4.2.2 of the wetlands bylaws uh, for Littleton defined the no disturb area as the first 50 feet of the buffer zone and states that no activity or work is permitted other than passive foot or no non-motorized vehicle traffic inside the NDA. Um, the vast majority of the proposed construction of this car path resides in the 50 foot NDA. And as I mentioned, the car path is not the primary access to the property and therefore should not, this construction should not be allowed. The commission has the authorities to do this and to actually to enforce the town bylaws. Um, as currently proposed tonight, this project has changed substantially compared to the original uh, date of the SECTIC plan back in 2014. Um, the changes include a redrawing of the 100 foot and 50 foot uh, no disturb line that we saw, a redesign of the proposed caption expansion as we saw. Also, the addition of new wetland flag series 100 through 107, as well as 200 through 209. There are new notations and erosion controls, uh, the relocation of the septic tank and pump chamber, and these were actually relocated so the applicant could install them outside of the 100-foot buffer while the project was under appeal. Um, this change to the plan also routes vehicular traffic uh, right over the mounted septic system instead of around it, which was what was shown back uh, during the 2017 hearing. Uh, the well location has changed and is now moved 35 feet closer and right to the edge of the septic system. And they're also on the plan, if you look closely enough, and I think Mr. Kyle was struggling as he zoomed in, that many of the engineering notations and elevations, uh, topography and guidelines specific and critical to design of a septic system are missing from the plan that's been submitted here tonight. Um, no professional engineer has certified or stamped the most recent plan that's been submitted, inclusive of all the numerous changes and substantial changes that I've outlined here. Uh, all the changes that uh, were made to the plan were made by the homeowner, uh, who holds no certification, allowing her to confirm that the changes to the plan are accurate. Uh, the applicant and it's also important to note, has violated general conditions of the order of condition while under appeal on three separate occasions, starting this project inside the buffer zone back in 2017 with the most recent violation of the OOC uh, this past August when she excavated below the frost line for a length of 35 feet in the buffer zone uh, after emailing uh, the commission about installing her well tank at her cottage uh, but failing to mention and actually mentioning specifically that all the work would be outside of the buffer, 100 foot buffer, um, but that wasn't the case. I respectfully ask, uh, given uh, the blatant violations on three separate occasions of work inside the buffer zone by the applicant, that the commission here um, uh, enforce the terms of the order of conditions and action be taken. Um, I wanna close by saying that section uh, 3.3.2 of the Littleton bylaw states that in making the determination for a requested amendment, as we hear of here tonight, that the commission will consider all factors, including whether the product meets the project meets the relevant performance standards. Here, uh, we have an important we have an important relevant areas of the wetlands missing from the plan submitted by the applicant, and the project does not therefore meet the relevant performance standards. Uh, we respectfully request that the commission deny the amendment of the order of condition and request instead that the applicant submit a new notice of intent 
that includes a plan with a current engineering stamp and a new project proposal that conforms to the wetland regulations in addition to the Littleton Wetlands Town Bylaws without exception. I want to thank the Commission for this opportunity to speak here and I hope its members choose a path of environmental conservation for the future of Fort Pond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Costa. Would you like to comment or would anyone like to comment on that? Uh, so, so Ms. Seward, I'm certainly happy to address those issues. I, I guess I defer to you and to the chairman as to um, whether the commission collectively has the interest in, in hearing responses. I mean, uh, again, to go back to what I stated a bit earlier, um, what I just heard in large part were critiques of certain aspects of wetland delineation not associated with the pond or the edge of pond, but elsewhere in the site. I heard reference to a certifiable vernal pool. I heard critiques about um, violations of the Wetlands Protection Act or the local bylaw. We dispute those things and I'm prepared, believe me, I know this case inside and out, I've been involved long enough. I'm prepared to address each and every one of those. But what's before the commission tonight is not the project. We're not back before you seeking a reapproval of what was approved in 2017. We're before you seeking a minor project change that reduces the footprint of the cottage expansion, removing a portion that would be within the 50 foot no disturb zone. And that shows you the location of the well and the septic tank and pump chamber, both of which are out now outside of conservation commission jurisdiction beyond the 100 foot buffer. So again, I'm happy to address the concerns if the commission would like me to, but I don't wanna belabor points that are of no interest to the commissioners. Right, I don't think that's what's uh, before us right now as well. Any commissioners have any questions, comments? I, I do have one other comment, if I could. Um, Excuse me. Uh, yes, attorney. Uh, Mr. Oh, McDonald. hi, Ken, Ken McDonald. Yes, Mr. McDonald, this is not a point. You have already spoken, so the commissioners will now be heard. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify, uh, Mr. McDonald, I thought you said that it was a certified, not a certifiable uh, uh, vernal pool. A certifiable vernal pool. Okay. Chairman, do we have any questions? Anyone else that hasn't spoken that would like to speak or do we have any motions? What would we like to do? Well, I mean, I find it difficult to absorb what Mr. McDonald said without actually seeing, he, he's talked about a lot of extra uh, like this. Right, but the, the only question that's being before us tonight is if the hearing, if the changes shown on the new plans meet these requirements. So we need to go back to what is being presented to us tonight, not everything else. Well, I'm, I guess I'm just worried that if there are things missing uh, from the plan. But this has already been settled in court too. We've it hasn't, and, and Mr. Costa was mistaken. It hasn't been settled. Is, is the meeting uh, It hasn't been settled. It, yeah, this, it, is, this it, is not, so let's follow the port of order of what has been asked tonight. So. They're asking for amendment to the existing order of conditions. What would the commission like to do? So this is Carl, I'll make a motion that we approve the project modification amendment to order of conditions on the Littleton Protection Bylaw. Do we hear a second? I'll second that. So we'll do a, a roll call. Um, first and last name, Jim. James Pickett, A. Anna. Anna Mayer, yay. Julie. Julie Rapier. Carl. Carl Melberg, yay. Kyle. Kyle Maxfield, yay. Sarah Seward, yay. Unanimous. Thank, thank you, you, Ms. Seward, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Green, thank you. Yep. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Amy, do I need to manually turn control back? Nope, you don't. You just go away. Oh, no, right. you can't go away. <laughs> Outstanding. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Next is our nine o'clock discussion enforcement order nine air road DEP 204-898. Do you want to speak to that? 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mark Arnold here with Goddard Consulting here on behalf of the applicant. I believe Greg Roy is also on the call um, to discuss the engineering questions that were raised. Um, this is a follow-up of the previous um, meeting that was discussing the enforcement order that was issued um, due to um, an apparent sediment impact to the wetlands, uh, the requirement for a restoration plan and uh, concerns over the stability of the site. Um, since that enforcement order has been issued, the applicant has um, constructed additional basins on site, hydro seeded slopes, um, provided additional gravel stabilization along um, Air Road, and also provided the commission with an updated SWIP um, to address comments that were raised in respect to um, those concerns. Um, I'm gonna ask Greg to kind of cover the SWIP um, as he's the engineer who has uh, prepared that. Um, I have provided comments to him just to make sure things are clear um, on how that SWIP is gonna be uh, enforced and uh, maintained on site so that uh, all entities are able to understand what's required to control the site and ensure that um, things outside the buffer zone um, stay controlled uh, so that way there's no impact to even the buffer zone from activities outside that. So. Um, Greg, if you could take that. Thanks, Mark. Can everybody hear me? Yes. So I'll be brief. Um, as Mark indicated, we, um, we, and as we promised you two weeks ago, we, uh, we went back through the SWIP um, and we do appreciate receiving your, um, your itemized uh, list uh, in writing. So we went back through, we, we um, amended the SWIP uh, document and we provided that to you. Um, I provided the uh, responses uh, to the, um, an itemized response uh, to your uh, comments uh, as they flowed through the enforcement order document. Um, we provided several uh, attachments as well. Um, one was, uh, one was a spill prevention plan uh, documentation. Um, and the other was uh, some drainage calculations to address the, um, sizing of the sediment floor base on site. Um, so I just wanted to um, kind of, as I stated, just briefly um, uh, acknowledge that all that has been submitted uh, as requested. And I think I'll turn it back over to Mark. So um, Amy, we do believe we have addressed everything in the SWIP that you had requested and um, I was wondering if you had had time to look at that to confirm that you were satisfied with the, the, the elements that we had made to that SWIP. I've been through portions of it. We didn't get it till Friday night, so I'm not sure how much the commissioners may have looked at it and have comments. Um, I, I did skim it, um, you know, again, Friday night makes it a little tough trying to balance homeschooling and full-time working as well. Um, it, it looks significantly better. I, I can, <laughs> you know, I will, I can tell you that. Um, but I haven't, I haven't gotten all the way through it. So we appreciate you doing that and putting that together, Mark. And Greg, how's the site doing today with the rain? Anyone been out or the last couple of days? So, um, we were not out today. Um, there's been very minor rain today. It's been some quarter inch um, scattered rain. We have been watching the forecast. I was watching the radar all day, seeing if, if there was a for if, if there was a thunderstorm that was going to hit the area. I was going to go up there. Greg was going to hit it. We did go out there um, last week um, during the heavy rain that occurred on uh, May uh, April 28th. Um, so that was I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was May. May it was Monday. Yeah, it was Monday. Yes. So Monday. So we were out there. I went out there. Um, it was after we'd had an inch and a quarter of rain. It was still raining very steadily as the site got a total of like an inch and a half. Um, so I was there near the end of the storm, but it was still raining fairly steadily. And I wanted to be there early morning. I was there about 7 a.m. to see what the site was doing while it was raining. Was there water moving anywhere, anything like that? So what I observed was one of the basins uh, on the to the left of the site entrance had some sediment, silty water in it, did not reach capacity. The basin to the right was completely dry. 
No water was coming from outside the buffer zone into the buffer zone. It was all being detained um, in depressions further up or up on top of the site. Um, no slope erosion of any kind. Water was all clean along the curb line of the road. Um, water was getting into the, the roadway catch basins as it normally does. Um, fairly clean um, for a roadway runoff um, with sandy edges. And we did. I did provide uh, the commission with uh, the SWIP report with photographs. And if you want, I can show you just so that the commission can see. These were the conditions of the site um, here. So we have um, the site entrance here, just looking at the slope. So this just gives you a general view of what it looks like. And then these are actually close-up photos, just to show you the actual soil texture, to show you that these are the slopes. You can see there's no rilling occurring, uh, ruts forming, nothing. There is absolutely nothing occurring on any of these slopes, which um, some of these slopes have been there for a bit and there's still been no movement through all the storms. This is the uh, edge of the roadway. Again, you can see the clean water, nothing getting to the catch basin, all clean here. The basin here, this is near the, uh, um, I was there on site for over like an hour and a half um, just because I wanted to be there during rain and kind of go out, check things, sit in my car, go out, check things. Um, there again, that basin had some water capacity still. This basin here was dry. Site entrance again, stable slopes. Here's the site entrance here, you can see this is uh, the water coming off of Route 2A, coming through to the basin. Um, wet conditions, but no surface runoff here, here. And then again, these are this, uh, just photos of the site slopes, just showing that there's no erosion happening, which normally you would see erosion rilling on these kind of slopes if there was any type of real fine content um, like sands and silts. And this is, these are just, again, the wetlands opposite the catch basins, no water coming up clean water coming out of the catch basin with a silt sack. This is the surface runoff here where the other catch basins clogged. So we observed nothing that was substantial there. Um, we have provided uh, an additional basin um, that's gonna be implemented um, outside the buffer zone in this location here. Um, once uh, construction conti activity continues as the gravel gets more compacted on the access road, to um, provide additional capacity. At this time, um, Greg and I do not feel that that's necessary. Um, we don't, we don't, can I just, know. you're pointing to white, pay, uh, white. Oh, you know what? Hold yeah. on. <laughs> Thank you. If you could adjust that, that would help. Let me see if that's, okay, it was the, here we go. Or Mark, did I call you Greg? Here it goes. Uh, so you should see the plan now. Um, so, we have two existing basins, left uh, and right, west and east of the site entrance. Um, as work continues and the road gets more compacted, we have a proposed um, infiltration trench just, for, just to ensure there's uh, no issue with compaction, going to another temporary basin outside the buffer zone to ensure we have additional control outside of the site. Um, Current site conditions don't dictate that this is, is necessary, but we have proposed it and have it set up to go in with a SWIP so that way it's implemented once site work starts just to ensure that that control is there. Um, this is um, looking at the site from a, a three inch storm event um, to ensure that we have control of um, all the water for even a three inch storm event. Um, so Mark, can I ask a quick question, just a point of, so I, I see where we are. Is that above or below where the scale is? Uh, it's just below it. Okay. Um, right. So the scale layer right now is the depression. So their water is, is kind of, is, 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 is kind of filtering there if it gets there. I wasn't seeing much water coming down, even from up, upgrading the site down to the scale layer. It was very, very small amounts just on the gravel road that had a little bit of compaction. If you scarified that gravel road, it would probably infiltrate. Um, right now, this site has um, really good infiltration compared to a, a stabilized gravel driveway that you might see in the buffer zone right now. There's more infiltration from the stone site right now in these slopes than you would see in a completed gravel road for a, a single family house in, in driveways around Littleton. Um, so so do you, 
So are you and Greg ready for us to do a site walk? Do you feel like everything's stable and would like to try and schedule that? Or are you, what point are you at right now? Well, our, our understanding from the last meeting was is that the enforcement order asked for a um, it asked for a restoration plan. And, and from my gathering of last week's uh, last time's meeting was that there was no place where restoration was needed. Um, so um, our understanding was the only other concern the commission was was uh, control of the site, which we we provided an updated SWIP with for for the details. Um, we provided a spill protection plan. We've we also have um, the fueling contractor. He has his own spill protection plan. He's also agreed to follow our spill protection plan. So we have two spill protection plans on site that are to be maintained. And on top of that, we are not personally storing fluids on site. So the only fluids that come on site um, for fueling are the fueling contractor who has his own spill plan plus ours. We have our spill kit on site. He's got his plan as well. We've doubled up on all of that. So from our understanding, we feel like we've addressed all the issues within the force war in the sense of violations to um, the wetlands, uh, wetland impacts. And uh, the commission didn't express last time that there, there, a meeting was uh, site walk was uh, was necessary. We haven't had any site changes since the last meeting. We weren't anticipating, and we didn't tell the commission we were doing site changes. We were just updating construction documents for clarity. Okay. Uh, um, as as a port of order, and I, I would bring this to the commission members that um, I believe in the past that when we have lifted one, we have done site visits to ensure that the erosion controls are in effect. But I I defer to the commission on that. I, I, this is Carl. I think we should do a site visit, Sarah. Okay, I'm just doing with w w what we've always done in the it past. Seems like, it just seems like it's been, yeah. 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 Changes have been made since we were last out, which was between the enforcement order and our last meeting. Um, so a, a, I believe a site visit is necessary. Yeah, I, I do understand that is a concern. I mean, I, I, on, on large projects, there have been major violations of the site. Um, in Littleton, uh, I, we haven't done full commission site walk. We've just had the agent walk it. Um, so I'm just wondering, do we have to organize the whole commission to come out or can the agent review that just to, to speed up the scheduling of that? Um, just because again, uh, we've had violations in Littleton that I've dealt with personally with sediment in the wetlands that we had to clean up. And we never had a full commission site walk, walk in the whole site, checking the erosion controls. Um, and this I, I, I would disagree that it's not, we're not expecting the whole commission to get there, but we um, as a committee try and relieve the agent from bearing that sole duty that usually there are a few of us, just like the day that we went out prior to the enforcement. So I would at least encourage two other commission members to go with the agent, which is what we have done in the past. Yeah, I, I would. But I defer to the commission what they would like to do. Well, and I think there's one other issue before we get to the site visit that um, it looked like, I, I don't know if maybe Greg could go through the calculations for the temporary basin, um, you know, to ensure that it's going to hold what it's supposed to hold as requested. Sure. Th thanks, Julie. Um, yeah, so we ran a, um, ran a hydrocat analysis um, analyzing the, both the existing basins and the tributary watersheds uh, of gradient. And then we, we also included the um, construction of the third basin uh, and sized that basin uh, so that it would receive um, flow from the, uh, the upgradient areas um, up at an upgradient to the, buff the edge of the limit of the buffer zone. And we use the um, the uh, EPA guidance for sizing sedimentation basins using the, the two-year design storm for that, uh, for those calculations. Uh, so um, the calculations provided, I think, document that both the existing basins can handle that uh, flow as well as that proposed basin. And that's con consistent with what we're seeing on the, on the, uh, on the site when we've been out there to uh, observe uh, water as well. Uh, water during a rain event, excuse me. Okay, and are those calculations different from the October calculations? 
Yes, because the uh, the October calculations are for a, a completed site. Um, so that that drainage report was for uh, final post, you know, compared pre-developed conditions to final post-developed conditions. This one is more of an interim um, uh, measure, which um, which just addresses um, conditions as they are today and the actual basins that were constructed and are proposed to be constructed for the sedimentation standpoint only. So um, the the drainage calculations that we did as part of the initial filing, um, those are still valid, and but those would be valid to document compliance with the final, uh, once things are completed out there with, with the final um, swale designs, and, you know, driveway swale designs and the basins uh, that we <clears throat> designed at the toe of the slope. That, thanks for that clarification. Okay. And did you, what did you do? So standard five, which is land uses with higher pollutant loads. Um, could you speak to, you know, how you handled that? In the uh, October report? The, the new one. The so October, no, I, the October I didn't. I just, exe you the, exempted because it's, it would be the finished condition is residences. Right. So th this analysis, I just did a volume, it was just a volume calculation. So it was just strictly to, um, to look at the volume that would be required to contain the two year storm event on the site. And did you consider the road runoff? Was that part of the part of the, you know, the run on basically, which is occurring? Was that part of the capacity for the calculations? Um, we did not, um, we, it's, it's our intention to, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Mark, but I don't know if we touched on this, but we, you know, that, that runoff has historically, uh, just gone directly to those catch basins and it's our intention to right. continue that, to, to kind of redevelop that condition. I think we discussed that, um, Julie, when we were out in the, the field there a few weeks back. Yeah. So. So um, if it's still going to your basin, though, my concern is that the road run on yeah. is going to your basin, which is what Mark had shown in his photographs, which means the road run on is taking your capacity, which wouldn't be reflected in your calculations. Great. Can you explain your assumptions with the calculations? Because the, the, the calculations that Craig did um, have, have baked in very conservative um, um, rationale to the amount of runoff that's actually being generated. Um, him and I's opinion is that the model is generating more runoff than it, the site actually will, um, based on site observations for sure, um, and just based on what we know with soils. But yeah. Greg, you, you have those calculations that you actually were conservative on the, the runoff generated. That, that, is, that is true. Uh, th thanks, Mark. So the... Um, SCS method has published curve numbers that we can use as part of this, as part of the analysis. The, um, really the only option we have to use is a gravel road uh, curve number. Um, and that's a pretty, as Mark alluded to that uh, earlier, that's a pretty conservative um, curve number for this site. Um, we're finding that the runoff characteristics are, are, are not, are just not there on the uh, on the upgrading uh, exposed um, uh, gravel slopes and, and the like. Uh, we've also um, used a, a very conservative uh, time of concentration number. We've used a six minute time of concentration number, um, and and again, we're just not seeing that. Uh, we're, we're tr truthfully, we're not seeing the uh, the flow concentrate <laughs> as it comes down. Uh, off those slopes. It's, it's just, it appears to us in, in every instance we've been there that it's infiltrating or exfiltrating, however you want to look at it, um, and, and really not making it um, in a surface flow condition. So, um, but I guess to answer your, your question, um, so, so there is that. Uh, we, we do believe that, that our calculation is conservative, um, but it, it is our intention. And I guess we have to go back and talk to the, uh, the, uh, the, the site contractor. Uh, I know that part of that was done with the installation of some of the Jersey barriers and things, uh, but it is our intention to keep that runoff um, on the, uh, fr from 
from impacting the basin. Um, we did discuss that a few weeks back and we have to circle through, circle back with that. So I, one of the things we, because of the concerns with the basin and the capacity, we've done these you know, stormwater calculations. Um, you know, typically we would do a third party review during the application process, um, which was not done because the stormwater calculations were done based on, you know, two single family homes and a barn relocation. Um, you know, whereas now we've had, you know, the, it seems like the project has changed a bit. And so, you know, now we've necessitated these calculations to demonstrate, you know, that a temporary basin is going to, um, you know, account for, you know, multiple cleared acres. You know, I, you know, I definitely appreciate the efforts with the calculations. I, you know, I, I am not a stormwater engineer and typically in this situation, we would have a third party review. Um, you know, I'm not, I, so the, the yeah the, the calculations were provided just to just to show you that we're 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 following SWIP requirements when it comes to stormwater management, um, and um, again we used a very conservative number of a, of a compacted gravel road that surface across the entire site, which is is not the site conditions at all on the site. Um, it, that, that kind of surface would start seeing, um, rolling on those kind of slopes or anything else. And that's not the conditions. Um, we're going to be maintaining the, the, keeping the water from the roadway into the curb line, getting it to the catch basins, which will alleviate that control. We had an inch and a half of rain. One basin didn't reach capacity. The other basin was dry. Um, we have, we have, aren't seeing erosion on the slopes, um, rolling, rutting of any, of any type. Um, we haven't any any major wetland impacts of any kind here, and um, so the the the, the number, EPA doesn't require that um, a SWIP be provided by a PE and be peer reviewed. It just requires a professional engineer or a CPEC like myself uh, who has that certification to do those calculations. I asked Greg to do it just because um, PE um, just has more experience with those numbers um, and can run them faster. And so I had him run those numbers just to verify that. And again, he used very conservative numbers there. So we feel this is a very conservative model, just just to help, just to give the commission extra assurance that we've we've double checked our things and we've we've taken um, your concerns seriously enough to have the engine to pay an engineer to actually run those numbers rather than just um, explain that oh we dug we dug some we dug some holes of this volume. And that's, um, we actually ran the numbers to know what the volume should be for a conservative a site. Um, and uh, we understand the commission would like to do a site visit um, and we're glad to accommodate that. So, so, so let me, let me ask the, the kind of elephant in the room question. Is this, is this still the same project that was proposed to us? C correct. The, the site, the site design has not changed at all. The, 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 the lots are still the same. The stormwater design is going to be the same. Um, we're not changing the driveway locations. We're not changing grading. Um, our, our, our intent is to grade the site as it was approved um, by the commission. And the, the plans showed um, the grading that's occurring now on the site plans. Um, it's, it's, I understand it's hard to visualize the, 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 the grading that's occurring on this site is a lot larger than most sites you'll see, um, but it is shown on the approved plans. So we're not altering um, any grading or proposed conditions on this site. It's, it's just a, a, a larger uh, earth movement operation than you would normally see, but it's, it's on the plans and we don't plan to change any of those uh, uh, intended conditions. I mean, th th this, this is still proposed for two lots, correct? Three lots. Three lots. It's a three lots. It's three lots. Three lots. Commission, um, do we want to go ahead and look at a calendar set um, site walk this week? What's everyone's pleasure? I'm available all day Friday and Thursday afternoon. Yeah, I, I would make myself available um, Thursday afternoon, probably after.
definitely after three. Friday's probably better. There is scattered rain showers on Friday. Perfect. Can anybody else go Friday or Thursday afternoon? Yeah, I can make myself Thanks. available as well. Oh, Which is best, Julie, Kyle? Friday is better for me. Okay. Yeah, I, did, I can defer to you guys. I, either one's fine with me. Right. Somebody want to throw out a time on Friday? Do we want to? Pref do we prefer going in a rain during a rain event? Yeah. It's always great. <laughs> okay. I can make myself available Friday. Amy, are you around Friday? Are you um, I, I've got something Friday morning, so like any time after 11 is fine. Okay. Homes homeschooling? Everyone that's remote learning, what time? You guys throw in a time. My kids are pretty uh, independent. That way, <laughs> they're right. 17, so uh, I can do any time. That afternoon would be easier for me. Mine are not. <laughs> no. what, what time works for you, Julie? Uh, one. Okay. Okay. Let, let, let's aim for one, and let's all remember face masks, social distancing. We'll just meet down at the bottom. Does that work for you all? Everybody else? Mark? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I can be there. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you guys Friday, 1 o'clock. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Stay well. Yep. All right, Mr. Chairman, let's keep going. Discussion enforcement order, Durkee, DEP file number 204-772. Want to throw in K2? Yep, might as well do all three at once. Oh, yep. Okay. Brian, are you on? Uh, I am. You want to take us through, you submitted on May 8th, your site walk summary? Uh, sure. So for the record, Brian Goodrow, Thancock Associates, and Chris Finner and Dave Guthrie are also here with uh, Durkee Farm Builders and K Land. So we were before the commission back on, I believe, the 25th, um, discussing the enforcement orders, and there were a handful of, of items that we uh, addressed. Amy and I subsequently uh, site walked on Wednesday, April 27th just to um, kind of codify everything that needed to be done for housekeeping. And then we issued a letter uh, following that site walk last week that kind of summarized the work that was going on today. Uh, just to touch on daily ongoing activities, Chris is on site every day along with Mike, and they uh, walk erosion control lines, inspect catch basins, street sweeping is a daily event to make sure that sediment is not... Um, being uh, accumulating within the roadway and then sub subsequently discharging to um, any of our uh, stormwater practices. Um, to summarize the letter, starting with Spruce Street, uh, we had a lengthy discussion regarding sedimentation that was coming down off Red Cedar into Spruce. Um, since the last hearing, all of Spruce has been loamed and hydro seeded. Uh, slopes on the upgradient side of the roadways have been jute matted. Um, the swale in between lot 52 and lot 17 was lined with jute matting. There's straw bale check dams in there. All of the um, siltacks have been cleaned out. Catch basins were vacuumed uh, all along the roadway throughout the subdivision. Uh, additionally, hay bales were put as check dams in the roadway at these catch basin locations. All of these practices are trying to, to stop sediment from getting into the pipe drain structure and then ultimately discharging into Basin 5 out on Spruce Street. Now, Basin 5, it was, uh, it was observed that some stormwater was reaching the first check dam and then breaching the forebay and going into the adjacent resource area. Um, hay bales were placed as check dams um, in that location. The erosion control mulch was spruced up, and that first cell now no longer has any um, water discharging through the, the stone wall. It, it was repaired, and 
in the manner that we had discussed both on site and at the last hearing. Um, that is the temporary measure when things dry out uh, as soon as the weather allows that section will be reconstructed to its original design intent. There is some sediment buildup in that four bay um, that needs to be removed, stone placed, uh, and then the, the berm that's adjacent to the rock wall um, reconstructed in a permanent fashion. But it has been uh, repaired and, and that condition uh, that was witnessed is no longer uh, occurring. There is an area uh, kind of on phase four behind lot 19 heading um, down Douglas to the south, uh, more towards Grimes. There was a, a section of erosion control that was identified during our site walk that could uh, use some additional erosion control measures. Bales were placed in about a 30 foot section uh, at the end of Lot 19's yard to supplement the existing erosion control line back there. Um, no new breaches, no new discharge was evident, uh, so that was corrected. To pivot to phase two up on Douglas at the opposite end where the infiltration basin uh, is currently, there was a, a rather lengthy discussion regarding some erosion at the base of the retaining wall. Uh, I went out there to take a look to understand exactly what was going on in that area. And it appears that the erosion, um, the significant erosion that was kind of at the base of the wall heading into that basin was pretty old. Um, and it had occurred prior to Cape Cod curbing being installed. Uh, you could see the rolling and going coming around the, uh, the retaining wall and then down the slope. So there, there are some small rills and some erosion of the side slopes themselves, but the roadway is no longer contributing to that area. So it's not um, making the situation worse. Ultimately, when that basin is dried out and cleaned out of sediment and then stabilized um, with a new layer of loam and, and, and vegetative cover, um, those slopes aren't going to aren't going to have that erosion, but I did not see anything um, new that would lead me to believe that the wall's integrity is is in question or that it's in in, in failure. Um, we walked the erosion control line in that area. It was supplemented pretty uh, pretty significantly with hay bales all along the back of the basin and then behind lot 35. Um, and those were in good condition. Sediment is, is being removed um, as site conditions um, kind of dictate. Uh, and then if you look up from um, that detention base and up Douglas on the left-hand side, uh, that's lot 37, 38, 39 as you go towards red. Uh, as you go towards Cyprus and Phase 4, those lots are now um, in the process of being loamed and seeded. Uh, straw bale, uh, excuse me, straw wattle was placed at the back side of the curb to limit any runoff um, and any sediment coming from those newly graded lawns um, where previously some of that was getting into the roadway. There is now a new line of erosion control there to, to limit that from happening. So what, what we've done kind of comprehensively is look at all of these, these trouble areas, um, address them, and, and take the step to get final vegetative cover. I mean, we, we are in the last, um, last leg of the race, if you will, for this portion of the site where we now have the majority of these lots hydro-seeded. The landscapers are working daily to, to expand that and stabilize everything that we can. And it's our expectation and, and our experience from, from the balance of the subdivision that once, once the lawns take, uh, take hold, these, these problems um, are no longer problems, uh, basically. So what we're kind of looking for this evening is a, a recognition of the, the work that we've done to date and the continuation of our ongoing um, site maintenance and of, of erosion uh, control and, and sedimentation management to be able to uh, essentially lift the enforcement order. We have a plan before the commission um, dealing with the 
intermittent stream uh, and water coming into the cul-de-sac on the end of Douglas. Uh, we proposed a pipe in that area. We'd like permission to, to get that pipe in and to get the rest of, of Douglas Road essentially graded um, and hopefully in the same condition as uh, the lots that we just uh, final graded to be able to get vegetation uh, kind of on this whole portion of the site and then um, pivot to our, our last phase, uh, phase four down Douglas, um, and then and then the subdivision. Um, Dave and, and Chris are here if they'd like to, to chime in um, with any so key Brian, points. So Brian, not to interrupt, but it sounds like you're ready for a site walk. Uh, if the commission wishes to have a site walk, we've already, we've had a number to date uh, with Amy and uh, the commission was nice enough to share a, a multitude of pictures of individual site walks that have happened. Um, obviously, if it is the commission's wish to have that, uh, we can. Uh, we, we've, we've done them to date. Commissioners, what, what would you like to do? Um, I think a site walk makes sense. Okay, do we want to do it right after the other one while we're all together on Friday? We could do that. That makes yeah. sense to me. That would make sense. Okay. I think it's it's better probably to do the air road earlier just based on traffic and then move over from there. We can meet up at the, the cul-de-sac. There's, there's more room to park up there. So if the site walk at 9 air is 1. Yep. Should we make it like two? I think we'd be there before two. Yeah. One thirty. Yep. I think we'd be there before then. Brian, are you available? Is somebody available on Friday? Uh, yes, we will. We will be there. One thirty. Okay. Yeah, we're just coming across town, so. Okay. Uh, could could we discuss the plan um, uh, for Lot 36 while we have the exhibit submitted um, kind of for approval uh, with the commission? If there are any concerns being raised, I would, I would certainly like to put those to rest because we are eager to to kind of wrap up this so portion the of the site. The discussion this evening is what's pertaining to the enforcement order. That was part of the enforcement order was to come up with a solution for that drainage. Okay. Do you have a plan, Brian, that you can screen share? Uh, yes. Yeah, I don't have that. Uh, so this is the exhibit plan that was submitted to the commission several weeks ago at this point. Um, and this is Douglas, uh, the cul-de-sac at Douglas. This is based in... 700, I believe, excuse me, basin 300. Um, and essentially water comes down. You can see what was the existing topography down this way. It was intended to be picked up by a catch basin in this location, site grading is such that it kind of gets dammed up a little bit. Um, in this area, we're proposing a pipe across the front yard um, and that would be the, the change to the approved plan is basically lot 36. Um, the footprint kind of got tweaked a little bit, the grading, and then the, the pipe uh, in lieu of overland flow, um, picking up whatever is, is coming on site. So this is just a point of clarification. This is that intermittent stream that correct, we're now correct. The one that we had because it was previously. it was filled with a road and we need drainage basically. So the, the uh, yeah the way the way that site grading worked out. Um, okay. Yep. So okay. we'll look. So we'll look at that on Friday replacement and kind of go through that. Then is that what we're hearing? Uh, we can certainly walk this area. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to see, like, get eyes on and discuss the pipe in the field would be useful to me. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. All right, we've got to keep moving. Um, any commissioners have any other questions on, on this? Okay, all right. Thank you, Brian. We'll see you Friday. Right, thank you. Thanks, Brian.
Yeah. I'd like to move on to the continued book hearing notice of intent for 10 Kativa Road, but I don't see we have a... Uh, no, I think, I think Amy just got it. I think it came in late, the DEP number. It's 204-911. I just didn't change it on the agenda. Okay. And I think, is anyone in for that hearing? I think we had told them that they did not have to come in once they got the number. I think that's uh, we have Eric. I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. All right. All yours. You didn't have any changes, did you, from the last time, Eric? No, we just, we did get our file number uh, May 5th came through. So we're just kind of waiting to see what happens at this point. So are we, now that we have the number, are we closing it? Or are you still waiting on something else? No, they you showed the plan last time that had okay. the uh, everything outside the 50 and the road controls shown. Yep, okay. Do we have a motion? Anybody want to make a motion? Oops. Uh, I guess I'll make a motion. Um, however, I... <laughs> um, Amy, what's the number again? 204-9-9-1 is a very distinctive number. <laughs> um, uh, all right. Uh, I'll make a motion to close the hearing and issue an order of conditions for mass DP number something, 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 911. <laughs> the first three numbers are. 204-9-1-1. Okay. Okay. Do I hear a second? I'll second it. Hey, Somebody Kyle, wants to second that? that? Yep, Kyle did. Kyle Max a second. Okay, so we'll do a roll call. James? Yay. <laughs> James. Anna. Anna? Anna Mayor, yay. Julie? Uh, Julie Rupp, present, because I just missed that discussion. Carl? Carl Melberg, yay. Kyle? Kyle Max will be yay. Sarah Seward, yay. Carries. Okay. Okay, thank you. And we got one more, I think, I believe. We have a certificate of compliance, Turkey Farm, lot 25204804. And then it says something five spruce. Yeah, it, they were just waiting for um, some lawn to grow, basically, and stabilized out there. So, is that one good to go? Is I it done? It's, it's good to go. I'm sorry, Jim. Is it done? Yes. Okay. All right. So somebody want to vote to um, make a motion to uh, issue the certificate of compliance um, for what Durkee number was it? Uh, uh, it's lot twenty-five. Lot twenty-five. Two zero four eight zero nine five spruce. Five spruce two zero four eight zero nine. You'll hear a second. Second. All in favor? Okay, so roll call, Jim. Uh, James, good yay. Anna. Anna Mayor, yay. Julie. Julie Rupp, yay. Carl. Carl Melberg, yay. Kyle. Carl Maxfield, yay. Sarah Seward, yay, unanimous. Yay. Now, are these, are these going to be all docu-signed? You're going to send a whole bunch yes. of us docu-signed? Yeah, yes. Don't hold your breath, but yes. <laughs> you know, you could just bring them Friday. We could all sign them. <laughs> but okay, James, do you want to adjourn? Uh, there's one yeah. more thing. I see. I see Kristen down there. I don't know if she wanted to say something or if she just never actually went away. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Skip her away. All right. We still had one or two discussion items. Uh, the hay license and Sari, do you get that? No, I have not done that. I don't. On the controls. Okay. I just put that on to annoy Sarah every day, every time. Yep. You can you can just keep it there. It doesn't annoy me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Fine. I think the whole thing is getting tired because everybody's breaking up. Yeah. Why don't you just here. adjourn it then, James? 
Somebody want to make a motion to adjourn? I move, move to adjourn. adjourn at 1021. Second. Do I hear a second? We have to do, yep. Roll call. James Pickett, yay. <laughs> Anna. Anna Mayor, yay. Julie. Julie Rupp, yay. Carl. Tom Melberg, yay. Sarah Seward, yay. Can I say yay? Yep. Uh, <laughs> Wake up. Yes, you did. <laughs> I guess I blacked out there. Wow. We'll see you guys on Friday. Be well. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.